you know, this is a, a very tenuous time in which we live, and uh, uh, we are seekers of the truth. And it's interesting, our guest tonight, before I, we bring on Joe here, our, our guest tonight is Eric John Phelps. He's the uh, he's a, a founder, and, uh, uh, well, he, he has the website, VaticanAssassins.org. Folks, if you wanted just a quick link, it's accessible off of our website, HomelandSecurityUS.com. Just click on the link there. It'll take you to Mr. Eric John Phelps' website, VaticanAssassins.org. But, uh, you know, um, uh, last week after speaking with Mr. Phelps, I had uh, uh, purchased the uh, e-book uh, version of his five volume, five volumes of information which we recommend everybody who can purchase that do so exactly um and i i was really caught up in this um the amount of information obviously in five volumes i, I think it's like 400 megabyte in terms the megabytes in terms of size in total um i i was interested in in one uh passage from second thessalonians Chapter 2, verses 3 to 10. I'm just going to read the first couple of sentences. Uh, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And uh, it goes... Uh, it, the scripture goes on to say that for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he now... Uh, let us will let uh, until he be taken out of the way. What this is is the mystery of iniquity, but um, uh, what is being said here and in other passages is we are truth seekers. We're supposed to seek the truth, however uncomfortable and however well, however uncomfortable it is. And, and I've well, both Joe and I have worked many investigations as, as career investigators. Myself for 28 years, Joe for um, 10, where we sought truth and and we we searched for truth. And I've got, I've got to tell you, sometimes the truth became uncomfortable, findings became uncomfortable, and when you look at things, when you think that something should be one way or you expect it to be one way, and it turns out to be something totally different. It kind of rocks your world. I, there's a, there was a statement somebody had said to me once. Um, when you hear hoofbeats, if you're on a ranch and you hear hoofbeats, you turn around, and you expect to hear or expect to see a horse, not a zebra. And think about that, folks, because you know sometimes the occasional zebra will appear. When, when in fact you're expecting a horse, and that does upset your your mental paradigm, your mental way of your, your, your way of thinking. It doesn't mean that the zebra's not there. It means that you weren't expecting it, or, or goodness, it upsets your your whole thought process. And and that's what we're doing here. We are we are seeking the truth, as uncomfortable as it might be. Now. Uh, I will say this, the term Vatican Assassins, when we talk about Vatican, the Vatican, a lot of people, and I'll get emails, and I just want to make this disclaimer, and then I'm going to turn it over to Joe, and he can bring Mr. Phelps on, but I'm going to make this disclaimer. When we talk about things such as the Vatican, you've got to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that we are not uh, picking on, or uh, this is not an indictment of Catholic, uh, the Catholic people, okay, uh, just understand that, because conquer into the Catholic denomination. Exactly right. It, it's we are, not, it's, this is the exposing the hierarchy, as all denominational churches now uh, are, as it's being seen publicly. The hierarchy has been co-opted, has been taken over, and an agenda other than the Lord's purpose is being uh, infiltrated. And used into this and pushed in this agenda, and we see it with the uh, Presbyterian churches uh, voting to allow uh, 
homosexual marriages. We see so many examples that, I mean, we could sit here and take the first hour just listing examples. But the uh, there was a, sh- a time I, I went on my anniversary, uh, went out of town on my anniversary, and my father did a show by himself, and he got into the Jesuit connection. And I, re- I remember receiving lots of emails about how you did real good exposing this. And um, from what you've talked about on that show, uh, that was like a cover page for what uh, I've read so far in this book. Oh, I've got to tell you, folks, it, go to VaticanAssassins.org, and if you download or purchase and I would urge everyone to, to purchase and download this book just, just to have it in your virtual library. Um, it, it is an eye-opener, to, to, to say the least. And with that, uh, Joe, um, we, we certainly welcome Mr. Eric John Feltz, the um, founder, director of VaticanAssassins.org, author of Vatican Assassins. And Mr. Feltz, it's great to have you on with us tonight. It's a pleasure, pleasure to be with you and your listeners tonight, Mr. Wagon. Well, I'll tell you, uh, both Joe and I were astounded by the volumes of information you've got uh, contained within the covers, virtual covers of your book, uh, the five volumes. Uh, what led you? Uh, I, I mean, I, when I read, when I was, when I, and of course I did not finish this in the, the week that I had, um, but I got to ask you, what led you to publish this work? Oh, uh, <laughs> I, I would say the it all started back when I was uh, 10 years old, when I was in fourth grade, 1963, when my teacher came into the classroom crying and weeping and uh said that the president's been shot. And uh, I was very fond of my teacher, Miss Beals, and I wonder what in the world could have happened to her. So it was a it was a traumatic experience that marked me. And I determined then that I would find out who did it. And I said to my father as a little boy, when LBJ was being sworn in on that Roman Catholic missile there, missile there on Air Force One, I said... He's guilty. He looks guilty. And then, of course, many years later, I realized and learned that the man who was sitting down looking up to him and winking was not of Malta, Jack Valenti. So we have a strong, powerful connection of the Knights of Malta to the Kennedy assassination. And with that, then, as I grew up and grew older, I learned of the um, Lincoln assassination when I was in Bible College, in Baptist Bible College in Clark Summit, Pennsylvania. I had a history professor there. His name was Dr. Rembert Carter, and he had a um, a class on the assassination of Lincoln. And he had a whole syllabus of of uh, sources that showed how the Jesuits were involved in that assassination. And one of those books was the Suppressed Truth about the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln by Burke McCarty, uh, dear lady who wrote the book in 1924, and also the great work by uh, uh, Thomas Harris on Rome's involvement in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. So that led me to think, well, you know, maybe there's some connection with the Jesuit assassination of Lincoln with the assassination of Kennedy. And then the last thing was the general attack on the King James Bible, because I didn't know that the new Bibles were translated from another text. And uh, when I found out that the Westcott and Hort Greek text, from which comes the Kirtland text and the Nestle text and oh, Mesker's third edition of the critical text, it goes on ad infinitum. But they're all based upon Jerome's Latin Vulgate. And according to the Jesuit Orders Council of Trent, the, the Latin Vulgate is the scriptures, not the Hebrew and Greek scriptures. So immediately there was a Jesuit connection to all three. And I thought in uh, a three-fold cord is not easily broken. And so that's when I began to... Um, seriously investigated. It took me over 20 years to put the information together on the Jesuit assassination of um, Kennedy. And then I had to... <laughs> I told my father that the Jesuits killed Kennedy. He said, gee, dear Eric, he said, if you're going to say the Jesuits killed Kennedy, you better write a book on it. And I said, okay. So that was kind of a spurning to write the book. And I gathered all the information, put the book together, and uh, and then uh, have it out with the Jesuits, their last 500-year history from 1534 when they were created by Loyola to uh, to really 9, uh, 9-11 um, in 2001. Then I updated with a couple of PowerPoints. But 
It's uh, it's really the history of the Jesuit order culminating the assassination of Kennedy. Of Kennedy, then goes on to the Cold War, goes on to Watergate and others, and then finally to 9/11. So I, I try to bring it up to date as much as possible to show the Jesuits run this country, they run the Roman hierarchy in this country, they run the Roman papacy, they run all the governments of the world, they run all the intelligence communities of the world. There's no such thing as them and us. They run it all financially, uh, politically, academically, and uh, militarily. So. Wow. Yeah. Mr. Phelps, one of the things that jumped out right in the first 15 pages of the first volume of your uh, book here was uh, the references to different, you know, the central intelligence. You talked about the, from Kennedy assassination to the um, World Trade Center, uh, 9-11 happening. And you make reference to this, you know, these different organizations, governmental organizations, uh, intelligence agencies and, and personnel, um, the Federal Reserve Bank. These are... Uh, tools that the Jesuits use? Are they partners in crime? Or is this uh, the Jesuits just, you know, manipulating these different uh, uh, power brokers for their means and ends? Um, wherever the Jesuits are, they rule. And so <clears throat> when you find the Jesuit presence in the Federal Reserve, they rule it. Through their various knighthoods, be it Skull and Bones, Knights of Malta, Knights of the Equestrian Order, whatever knighthood you want to use, ultimately they're run by the Jesuit Order. So when you see when you see a Knight of Malta like um, William J. McDonough, who is the past head of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York City, you know the Jesuits run it. Or when you see another former Knight of, another Knight of Malta who was a former head of the New York Bank, because remember the, the 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 New York branch of the Federal Reserve Bank is the most powerful branch. That's where they store all their gold. They have over six hundred sixty thousand gold bars in the Federal Reserve Bank there. And the president, the past president of that bank was Peter G. Peterson. Peter G. Peterson is the head of the Blackstone Group, powerful CFR presider, and a knight of Malta, and also a purchaser of the medical wing at Loyola University, which is run by the Jesuits in Chicago. So their knights, their agents, are everywhere in their key organizations, be it the banks or the military. For example, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is knight of Malta, Martin Dempsey. So you got a Knight of Malta okay. running the Joint Chiefs of Staff. you got a Knight of Malta that's the head of the Supreme Court, John Roberts. So the Jesuits run everything through their knights. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. uh, all right. Um, just just so you know, and, and folks, what we try to do here is, you know, we throw around uh, terms like New World Order and the power elite, Illuminus, the Illuminati, the uh, power brokers, and so on and so forth. And, and a lot of times, you know, it, it seems like we just give these terms lip service. Now, here's a here's the author, and uh, again, our guest, Eric John Phelps, VaticanAssassins.org, that has studied this for uh, uh, for a quarter of a century. The, 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 the what we're talking about here, and what Mr. Phelps references, the Jesuit Order, which has been what around for about five. It's a 500 year old covert operation, geopolitical mail only organization. It's really structured as a military operation, isn't it? Um, that's correct. That's what Napoleon. Okay. Well, that's what they say. Okay, they have a magazine called Company. Anybody can subscribe to it, and that's a military term. Okay. All right. Um, but but I, I think the the approach here, because this is such a voluminous. Uh, I mean, your, your your book is just. <laughs> I talk about encyclopedic. Um, I, I guess what we're looking for here is we're trying to make sense of chaos. So the chaos that we see today, we're trying to make sense of it. We're trying to see whose agenda um, people are following and who's who's pulling the puppets, who are the puppets and who are the string pullers of the puppets. And, and I guess if we approach it tonight that way and just kind of turn you loose in the sense of giving us an outline, uh, telling us information that we need to know, and start wherever you like, but uh, uh, as if you're doing a presentation. Okay. Um, you know, um, that might be the best way. I just want to say that perhaps might be the best uh, method of time, and, and if there's questions that we have, we'll kind of bump you, but uh, you know, or ask the questions. But uh, but if if we want to, if you want to start with the Jesuits, or if you can if you can help us make sense of what's going on today, based on history and based on what was set up, well, that'd be great. Sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's go back to the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages lasted approximately a thousand years, from well, conservatively from 606, 
uh, when the Pope was declared to have universal spiritual power to about uh, 1648 when that's determined to be the formal end of the Dark Ages with the uh, end of the Thirty Years' War. And during this time, the Pope was in the zenith of his noonday power. Because remember, the Pope had not only... Uh, if you look at the Vatican flag, there is a silver key and there's a gold, golden key. And uh, you have a triple crown on it. Papal authorities, the crown stands for Lord of Heaven, Lord of Earth, and Lord of Hell. The two, the two keys, the golden key stands for the Pope's universal spiritual power. That is, there's no salvation outside of the Roman Catholic Church. There's no salvation outside of being submitted to the Pope, which is what that means. The silver key means that the Pope claims to have universal temporal power. He has universal political power. And the temporal power was given to the Pope by Pepin in 756, claiming that he had the right to rule Rome and the vicinity there as a sovereign nation. So the Pope claims two powers with his two keys. The right to rule all people spiritually, to tell them what they can believe, because the papacy does not believe in freedom of conscience. The second thing is they believe that he believes that he has a right to rule all governments on the face of the earth, that no government should rule for the benefit of the people, that it should rule only for the benefit of the Pope in keeping the people submitted to him and enforcing his policies. That's the basic, long and the short, of the diabolical presence and power of the papacy. So what happened was the Protestant Reformation took place. Luther starts it October 31st, 1517. He nails his 95 Theses of the All Saints Church in Wittenberg, Germany. And that begins, really, the movement of what we would call the Protestant Reformation. During this time, the Bible will be put into the hands translated into the hands of the common man. And this is what the papacy has utterly forbidden. And so now men in, in Germany will read the Bible in their own German language with the Luther Bible. The Dutch will read the Bible in their own language in their Dutch Bible, which is a Reformation Bible. Uh, the English will read it in their English Bibles, and ultimately the culmination of the greatest English Bible being the AV 1611 King James Bible. And so, so the Bible is in the hands of the common man. And William Tyndall said, I will make the average plowboy more knowledgeable in the scriptures than any priest. And that's exactly what happened, for which he was later strangled and burned at the stake in Belgium by the agents of Cardinal Wolsey. So the Reformation versus the Counter-Reformation is now going to come in play. The Lord starts his, his Reformation, getting the Bible in the hands of the common man, and the devil has his Ignatius Loyola and the founding of a new powerful secret society that will be the replacement of the Knights Templars. The Knights Templars were the most powerful secret society in the Dark Ages. They ran all the banking. They ran the kings of Europe. They were next to the Pope. Uh, they had no rivals. And they became so powerful that Pope Clement V had to suppress them with the papal bull uh, Vox and Excelsius in 1312. Uh, the Templars were suppressed. Jacques de Molay was burned at the stake. And the Templars went into hiding. And they went into hiding in Scotland. And there they stayed for several centuries. They waged war on the Knights of Malta. They started the Peasants' War in the 1380s or so in England. Killed the Grand Master of the Knights of Malta. So the Templars were, on, were never really destroyed. And in 1534, there's a Spanish Knight Templar named Ignatius Loyola, and he's going to revive them. And they're going to be called the Knights of the Virgin Mary. And so as he revives the Templars under this name, he changes the name to the Society of Jesus, which John Calvin called the Madmen, known as the Jesuits. So he starts the Society of Jesus for two purposes, and this is according to James J. Wiley in his great work, The History of Protestantism. It's a three-volume set. In the second volume, he gives us a 50-page record in history of the Jesuits, which I copied every page and I put at the end of my book. And he tells us that the purpose for the establishment of the Jesuits was, the first, first purpose, was to take Jerusalem from the Saracens. That's the first purpose. 
The second purpose was to destroy the Reformation and to bring all nations back under subordination to the Pope of Rome. The Jesuits went on to write certain works. One was called The Secret Instructions, where they laid out how they would take over the wealthy, how they would ultimately take over countries. They would be the advisors to kings and nobles. And uh, I also include this with my um, CD, on my 13 rare book CD. One of them is The Secret Instructions. So the Jesuits are busy functioning in their stealth. They have the infamous Oath of the Fourth Vow, where they promise to uh, use the knife, the gun, the strangulation cord, and the poison cup against any notable public figure that would resist them. And of course, they did this with John F. Kennedy in 1963 in obedience to Francisco Sarez's work on the regicide called Des Regi. So the Jesuits became more and more powerful. And as they spread throughout Europe, nobles would give them fortunes, give them castles, and uh, they began to rule all the kings of Europe. And they became so powerful is that they attempted assassination of King Joseph in Portugal in the 1750s. And as a result, <clears throat> they were suppressed by uh, the king and his great prime minister, Cavalho de Pompao. Sebastian uh, Cavalho de Pompao. And so they, the king suppressed the Jesuits forever out of Portugal and all of the Portuguese holdings, which included South America. That's 1759. And then in 1764, France, with uh, Louis XV, um, heavily influenced by Madame de Pompadour, suppressed the Jesuits out of France and all of their holdings, all of their foreign holdings. And by the way, to show that the Jesuits run the skull and bones men in the crypt, one of the things that they do in their initiation is they uh, they desecrate the, the, a, a pretended body of Madame de Pompadour because she was a tremendous enemy of the Jesuits. And the other thing they do is they kiss the slipper toe of the Pope. And the other thing they have is Don Quixote there in the tomb, and the Don Quixote represents the Jesuit general. So with the suppression of the Jesuits out of France in 1764, the final coup de grace, really, is the king of Spain. Now, these are all Roman Catholic kings. Yeah? These Roman Catholic, and this is during the first great Masonic schism because their, their advisors are Masons, and the Masons are going against the Jesuits here. Uh, Charles Sewell of France, the advisor to Louis XV, is the one behind expelling the Jesuits. Uh, uh, Sebastian de Pompeo, Cavalho, he is amazing. He's behind suppressing the of Portugal. And Aranda, who's the right-hand man of the King of Spain, he is the one behind, he's amazing. He's also behind kicking them out of Spain and all the Spanish holdings in South America and Mexico. And, and uh, so in 1767, they expel all the Jesuits out of South America out of Mexico, out of Central America, the King of Spain it was a bourbon, just like the King of France was a bourbon. They are now the absolute enemies of the Jesuit order. The Jesuits were rounded up, put on ships in South America, and sent back to Sevilla They all landed and were kept on the island of Corsica for a while until after the French Revolution when they would raise up their great avenger from Corsica, named Napoleon Bonaparte. And the Jesuits would run the French Revolution as punishment for the kings of France and the other kings of Europe who would dare to suppress them. So the whole French Revolution, Napoleonic Wars, was nothing but Jesuit payback. And this time, during this wonderful window of time, God would move and he would send a great awakening in America through the preaching of George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards. And as a, as a result of this great awakening from about 1720 to 1750, uh, there was a great turning to the Lord, and that would be the foundation for the Calvinist, Baptist, and Presbyterian American Revolution against the dictatorship of King George III, who took in the Jesuits and was protecting them when the Pope suppressed them in 1773. So that's the other major thing. The Knights of Malta kicked the Jesuits out in 1768. From Malta, they're forever banned, and the Pope suppresses the Jesuits in 1773 with a papal bull, Dominic Acredemptor Noster. It is not a brief, it's a bull. And so when the Pope suppressed the Jesuits, they then had to find places to stay. They had to find refuges. And so their two major refuges, refuges were in an Orthodox country and a Lutheran country. Catherine II the Great protects them in Russia, and Frederick II the Great protects them in Prussia. And that's when Frederick and Catherine invade Poland, they divide Poland, and so the Poland is now not under a Roman Catholic monarch to enforce the papal bull in suppressing the Jesuits, so the Jesuits are, can stay in Poland with all their huge fortune and all their schools and all their property. 
So the Jesuits then are busy plotting the the overthrow of the kings that had suppressed them, including the Pope. They will put, they will poison the Pope with a keta, according to uh, Theodor Geisinger in his great work on the Jesuits told to the German people that he wrote in 1873. He said that the Jesuits poisoned the Pope with a keta, which was a horrible diabolical poison, and depending on the dose, depend on how slow or how quickly the victim would die. So bad was the poisoning, the Pope said, alas, I knew they would poison me, but I didn't know they would poison me in so cruel a manner. So the Jesuits were now in, in becoming, more, uh, becoming in charge. They, they kidnapped Pius VI with Napoleon and brought him over the Alps, and Pope Pius VI dies. So Pope Pius VII is taken by Napoleon. He's in prison for five years and until he agrees to restore the Jesuits. So when King George III has his British forces rescue Pius VII after five years of imprisonment, the first thing they do is they take him back to Rome, and the first thing the Pope then does is restore the Jesuits in 1814. So they're restored in 1814. They were already restored in America in 1805. They were restored in Russia in 1801. They were restored in America under the presidency of Thomas Jefferson, who did not object, which tells you much about Jefferson. And uh, the Jesuits then are back in power by 1814, and so they have what's called the Congress of Vienna. And in the Congress of Vienna that meets from 1814, 1815, a little longer than that, they plot a massive conspiracy for the overthrow of the North American heretic nation of the United States of America. So this, this continues under the Secret Treaty of Verona in 1822, where they continue the plot with the high contracting powers of Europe. And then in 1823... James Monroe, with the, with the aid of Jefferson, comes out with the Monroe Doctrine and tells and says that there will be no European invasion into North America or South America. Well, the Jesuits so hate Monroe and Jefferson and Adams that they're going to poison Jefferson and Monroe on the same day, on July 24th, 1826, I believe. And they hate Monroe so much that they're going to poison Monroe on July 4th, 1831, or thereabouts. But it's on July 4th for all three presidents. The Jesuits have killed 14 American presidents. And so then, uh, after that, the Jesuits then plan their plot, plot their plan of overthrowing America. They tried it again with King George in the War of 1812. They failed. Thank God that he sent men like Andrew Jackson and uh, later became president to do away with the Bank of the United States, run by the Masonic Scottish Rite Formation and controlled by the Jesuits. And uh, God, God kept our country in place. He founded it with the great man of God, George Washington, who was a Baptist. He was not a high-level Mason. He didn't go into a Masonic Lodge but once or twice in the last 30 years of his life. These lying Freemasons, the Scottish Rite, want to tell you, he was some sort of a super Freemason. He was not. And he was baptized by his favorite Baptist chaplain, uh, John Gano, in the Hudson River in 1783, in the witness of 100 people. So... But Washington was a Baptist, and he was a Bible-believing man of God. The reason why he didn't attend certain communions with certain preachers like Green and others was that they were, they were Tories. They were loyal to the King George. Washington didn't want to have any communion with any of those traitors. So we had the, great, the greatest man of the 18th century, who was George Washington. And then we had one of the greatest men of the 19th century, who was Andrew Jackson, preserved our country, but still the Jesuits plotted and planned to overthrow our country. And they managed to uh, do much of that in the war between the states, what I call the War of Northern Aggression, where they used Freemasonry on both the North and the South sides to then incite the war and then have a war of annihilation primarily against the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants and Baptists of the South. And in that war of annihilation, and to, after the war, to, to bring millions of Roman Catholics over to this country and settle them in southern cities to then ultimately attempt to Catholicize the South. So their whole purpose has been to Catholicize North America. Now they're really doing a good job with all their alien Roman Catholic, Mexican, and Hispanic invaders, and uh, which has been their design since 1876 that I can prove in... Uh, in R. W. Thompson's great work, uh, the, the, the papacy and the Roman papacy and the civil power, where they said they were going to Catholicize their southern borders, and they're doing it right now. So the Jesuits are back in power by 1901. They're in complete power after they assassinate James Garfield. Of course, they assassinate Lincoln in 1865. They assassinate uh, uh, James Garfield. Pardon me, in the 1880s, 1881. Then they assassinate William McKinley in 1901. 
And then with that, they're in full power with their Masonic king of the empire, Theodore Rex Roosevelt. And there's a book that your listeners might want to get titled Theodore Rex. So they're in charge. And Theodore Roosevelt is under the most powerful churchman at the time in the nation's history. And that's James Cardinal Gibbons. James Cardinal Gibbons is the, is the, is the king of Baltimore. He's the Archbishop of Baltimore and a cardinal. According to Justin Fulton in his great work, Washington in the Lap of Rome, uh, that cardinal had a wire, a secret wire from the Baltimore uh, uh, Cathedral to the White House. So back then, the, the, the hierarchy was telling the president what to do, especially Grover Cleveland. So it continues, and Theodore Roosevelt comes to power. From then on, it's been a huge, massive buildup in this country, where they converted our beloved little federal Protestant Baptist Republic into a Holy Roman, 14th Amendment, corporate fascist, socialist, communist American empire from sea to shining sea. And that's how we understand all the wars after 1865. There's just been wars for the benefit of the Roman papacy. The Indian Wars of the Great Plains, all to subject them to, to reservations and building of their huge empire that they would restore that they would use to restore the post-temporal power of the world. So they, they're in control of America. They've been in control of Great Britain. Uh, the 19th century was a British century where the Jesuits conducted all their design through the British Empire and the British Crown, including Victoria and others. And then the 20th century was the American century where they conducted all the wars with the American military for the benefit of the papacy and for the destruction of the American people, and particularly the Protestants and the Baptists, because we have to destroy the Reformation. We have to bring the world back to the Dark Ages when the Pope ruled all nations from Rome with his temporal and spiritual power. That also includes we have to destroy the middle class because the middle class is an outgrowth of the Protestant Reformation, and we have to confiscate all the guns because gun ownership is a result of the Protestant Reformation. The Pope has always been against gun ownership, always against owning weapons of defense. In fact, during the Dark Ages, the Pope made it against the law to own a crossbow because the bolts of the crossbow would pierce the armor of the knights. So that's what they're planning now. Take the guns, uh, final destruction of the Reformation, uh, destruction of the middle class. We're going to have more and more of this financial collapse, quote-unquote, for the destruction of the middle class, and then ultimately we're going to have martial law. What we're going to do is we're going to drive white men to desperation. That's their whole purpose, to drive white men to desperation, rage and desperation, and then have the escape for them with a new right-wing fascist military dictator. And this is exactly what the Jesuits have designed. It's going to be what they did in Germany. It's going to be done all over again here in North America. You're, you're talking Jesuit... about you're – ta I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but you're talking about genocide here. You're talking about war, genocide, yeah. depopulation? That's correct. I'm talking okay. about implementation of the Council of Trent, exactly as was done in the, second, in the first 30 years' war when they killed – it was a world war – when they killed approximately one-third of the population in Germany. Uh, it's going to be huge here. That's right. Mm -hmm. And they have it all in place with the Department of Romeland Security. That's what I call it, Department of Romeland Security and the Catholics in Action, called the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, run for the most part by Knights of Malta, like Leon Panetta and, and uh, George J. Tennant and others. So, And then you've got the NSA. The NSA, uh, the, the symbol for the NSA is a silver key being clutched by an eagle. Well, the silver key, if you go to the NSA website, it will tell you it represents the power of Peter in his binding and loosing. <laughs> so who has the power of Peter? Why, it's the Pope of Rome. And so oh, yeah, the NSA yeah. is doing – yeah. So the NSA is doing nothing but enforcing the temporal power of the Pope. Uh, oh, okay. Now, now, just so I understand this and our listeners understand this, um, the uh, – wow. Okay, the, the Jesuit order – once again, you're looking at a five, five hundred plus year old, uh, really a, a secret society, if you will, a covert operation. That's a geopolitical, uh, patriarchal system, as I as I understand it from from your writing. That's correct. Okay, mm -hmm. it's structured as a secret military operation that operates in the background. They, of course, have, and we've heard about this too, where they demand their secret house and complete obedience to. Uh, their direct superiors, ultimately the superior general, which is, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, the ultimate authority here is the Black Pope. Uh, uh, is that is that correct? Uh, That's correct. 
That's correct. Okay. Right. Uh, the Jesuit Superior General was given the name of the Black Pope by the Italians because he, right. he was obviously more powerful than the Pope, and he always would walk around in a black cassock. All so right. they they gave him that name because of his cassock. So mm-hmm. so he is okay. the power behind the papacy. Yeah, and he has been. All right. For, yeah, his, 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 okay. Since, uh, since eighteen fourteen. And, and one thing too, and, and then I'm going to shut up here um, and let you continue. But uh, again, just so because this is a lot of information, a lot of historical background, and so important, folks. I, I mean, if you want to know where we're headed, just look where we've been. I mean, look behind us and let's study history. Um, so we're talking about the Jesuit order, which is also officially known as the Society of Jesus, um, which was originally used by the Vatican to counter the various Reformation movements in Europe, uh, to which the Vatican lost much of its, uh, uh, or, or to which the Vatican, uh, well, yeah, they, they lost much of its religious and political power uh, to, to the, uh, the uh, Reformation. As they refer to it, the sovereignty. Right. Of the Pope, and they say the, the the Pope, their belief is the Pope is sovereign over all kingdoms and governments of this world, uh, as a representative of Jesus on earth. Is that correct, Mister Fox? That's that's correct. I bring you to page fifty-two in the Providence of God. I just happen to turn over this page, page fifty-two in my book, and here's what Thomas Aquinas wrote in his Summa Theologica in twelve seventy-two. Quote: The Pope, by divine right, hath spiritual and temporal power as supreme king of the world. That is the doctrine of Thomas Aquinas. He's called one of the foremost theologians of the Roman papacy. He's called the angelic doctor. And that is their doctrine. Supreme king of the world. In fact, when a pope is coronated, that's what he takes. He's the governor of the world. And all the popes are as his altar boys. That's right. Here's here's another quotation from um, this Roman Catholic, David S. Fellin, in 1913. He writes, why, if the government of the United States were at war with the church, we would say tomorrow, quote, to hell with the government of the United States. And if the church and all the governments of the world were at war, we would say, to hell with all the governments of the world. Why is it the Pope has such tremendous power? Why, the Pope is the ruler of the world. All the emperors, all the kings, all the princes, all the presidents of the world are as these altar boys of mine, unquote. And now we understand why Ronald Reagan, in 1984, formally acknowledged the sovereign state of Vatican City, aided and consented to by the by the Senate of this country, because now the Pope is absolutely the king of this country, ruling through his de facto military government ruled by the conqueror, the President of the United States, since March 9, 1933. Okay, March 9, 1933. What's the significance of that date? On March 9th, uh, 1933, well, I'll go back to the 4th. I'll go back to the Great Depression. Great Depression hits in 1929. Everything crashes. Of course, the Great Depression was caused by three Irish Roman Catholic short sellers. The first and foremost being Joe Kennedy. For this, Joe Kennedy is going to be made a Knight of Malta. The, 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 and also John J. Raskob's in on this too because Raskob has encouraged all the farmers to invest on Wall Street, invest on the stock exchange so we can crash it and steal all the funds of the farmers, which for the most part are white Protestant farmers and Baptists. So now we're going to have the Great Depression. It's going to be a huge confiscation of wealth. In uh, 19, uh, 1929, the, uh, the, the, oh, the the market falls in October. In February of 29, uh, the Pope is given back his temporal power in the Lateran Treaty in Italy. And one of the things he's given is reparations, quote-unquote, for what? For 50 years or so, nearly 60 years of losing his temporal power from 1870 to 1929. Those reparations were approximately $90 million in gold. So what happens is, the this huge fortune that the Italian people were had to pay off to the Pope was then used to buy the many of the businesses on the on the stock market when they crashed in twenty nine for pennies on the dollar. So now they're buying up the stock market and they have caused a crash and the people are desperate and the the depth of the crash is in nineteen thirty two when they then have FDR put into office, who's a 32nd degree Freemason, apostate Episcopalian, and having his political uh, career put together by that Knight of Columbus, Al Smith, aided and abetted by that Knight of Malta, um, 
Nicholas Brady, who financed a Jesuit novitiate just 15, 10 miles away from me here in Pennsylvania. So they put FDR in office uh, that has arranged the mobs involved in it because Lucky Luciano is the personal friend of John J. Raskov. John J. Raskov was one of the heads of DuPont and uh, and, uh, and and another big company. Uh, he was the head and he was also um, one of the chairman of the Democratic Party. So John J. Raskov is a personal friend of Lucky Luciano. So Lucky Luciano gives the order to all his mafia men that are controlling labor to have their people vote for FDR. So FDR is put in office by the Pope of Rome. On March 4th, when he takes his inauguration, there are no less than six Knights of Columbus in the background. You can watch this on a video. Just Google for the March 4th presidential inauguration of FDR, and you can see their hats moving around, their fourth-degree men with their fourth-degree hats on, the chapeau, as they call them. And so as FDR, is, he begins his inauguration, what he says is, he says, this is a day of national consecration. Consecration is a religious term. You look it up in Black's Fifth, you look it up in any law dictionary, it will tell you it is a religious term that's used by an archbishop or a bishop to consecrate a church or consecrate a land. It's a Roman title. What FDR told us there is he was going to consecrate the entire country, all the labor, all the land, and all the businesses, set it apart for the use of the Pope. On March 6th, and then he ends, he ends by saying, and in making this dedication, a dedication is the same thing. A dedication is the conqueror having conquered a nation, then dedicating all the property that he has taken for public use. This is the beginning of public policy that took our gold from us, that suspended all gold payments and contracts of H.R. 192 and then public law 7310. They did this to us. They took it all. So on March 6th, FDR now, on March 6th, puts forth Proclamation 2039. In this Proclamation 2039, he declares a state of national emergency, premised and based upon five, Section 5B of an act of October 6, 1917. He never tells you what that act is. That act is the Trading with the Enemy Act. So on the basis of the Trading with the Enemy Act, which was supposed to be surely a World War I statute that was never repealed, that was amended 14 times from 1918 to 1913, it was kept in place so that it could be used as a basis for this presidential proclamation to put this country under military government. On March 6th, with all those Knights of Columbus waving their hats behind FDR, telling all the Roman Catholics in the, in the foreground there, yeah, we're behind this Protestant Freemason. And I, I know if I see at least two priests in that picture. One has an obvious Beretta on. So when he does this, on March 6th, he declares a state of national emergency. He, Section 5B of the Trading with the Enemy Act is amended so as to eliminate all transactions within the United States. So therefore, the Trading with the Enemy Act is going to be applied to all transactions, not only outside the United States concerning enemies, but also within the United States. And making and in doing this, he seized all the banks. He made every Amer private American citizen, he made them a public citizen by seizing them, and he, uh, he, he seized all the labor, all the land, and all the businesses by doing this. He made every American an enemy under Trading with the Enemy Act. And that's why every time you go to court, you see a, you see a martial flag. Every time you go through the airport, you see a martial flag trimmed in gold fringe or with gold cord and tassels. Every time you go to a public school, you see a martial flag. Every time you go to most hotels, you have a martial flag. We've been under emergency war powers since March 9th, 1933. So what happens is, March 6th takes place, he seizes everything, and he, that means he also is going to seize every congressman and every senator, because they're now going to be public U.S. citizens, because they all have, it's assumed they all have birth certificates where they're registered on property on a state level. And the conqueror seizes all property on a state level, all registered property on a state level. So now they're the property of the conqueror. All the congressmen are his property. The Supreme Court are his property. Um, so, and uh, when these congressmen get together on March 9th, they said, we have a tremendous emergency here, and we need to pass this act, this Emergency Banking Relief Act, based upon what? Section 5B 
of, Octo- of an act of October 6, 1917, trading with the Enemy Act. So now the Emergency Banking Relief Act is going to find its basis in the trading with the Enemy Act, just like Proclamation 2039. And so now, this very same day when the Congress passes this act, they never read it. It wasn't even in written form. And so now that they pass this act and and they, they, they approve and confirm everything the president does from March 4th and thereafter, everything, including Executive Order 6102 that FDR is going to cut on uh, April 5th of 1933 and gives all the first people in the United States till May 1st to turn in all their gold because what does he premise that executive order on? An act of October 6th, 1917. So they take all of our gold. Uh, they, they say it's against public policy to have gold in contracts. They take it all. They took all our gold. It's a huge, massive grand theft. They take all the labor. From then on, you're going to have labor, Department of Labor, because labor belongs to the conqueror. And then, not, uh, about the same time, they're going to pass the 20th Amendment. And the 20th Amendment will be the new date for the inauguration of the conqueror. No more on March 4th for the president of the republic. He's now the conqueror is inaugurated on January 20th. And, F- and FDR was the last president ever to be inaugurated on March 4th in his first term. Every term thereafter and every president thereafter is inaugurated on January 20th. They're the conquerors, no matter if they're Republican or Democrat. So on March 9th, he then puts forward Proclamation 2040. And 2040 just restates Proclamation 2039 because now it's been legitimatized by the Emergency Banking Relief Act based upon the Trading with the Enemy Act. So from March 9th, 1933, the Senate told us in 1973 that we've been under a state of a temporary emergency for 40 years. 40 years. And it has never been repealed. And so... What we have now is we have the Jesuits with their military conqueror, the President of the United States, ruling as a conqueror, um, in complete and total control of all the finance and the war machine of this country, because all that matters in this empire is commerce and war. And they use all the commerce and the war of this country to wage war on other nations that the Pope has decided, pardon me, to subjugate to his temporal power. That's all it is. From World War II onward, so when I found this out, that this was done to me, I took my Air Force uniform and I threw it in the trash because I was a sucker for five years. So this is what they've done. They've taken over the country. They've taken over. The, they've ousted the de jure government that arose from the Constitution and have replaced it with this military, de facto, statutory-based military government. And all this was set forth in perfect design in Berkheimer's Military Government and Martial Law, uh, first printed in 1898. So the Jesuits have taken it all. They own all the money. They own the banks. They took all the gold. They own all the labor. And they do it in a very interesting way. They put a, they put a birth certificate on the pool, which is nothing more than a Roman Catholic baptismal certificate. A baptismal certificate creates a citizenship of the sovereign state of Vatican City. Every Roman Catholic has dual citizenship. He's a citizen of the United States, and he's a citizen of the sovereign state of Vatican City. Well, the Jesuits just took that principle of creating citizenship with a baptismal certificate because it's signed, sealed, and delivered to a third party. They're all stored. The the originals are stored in the Vatican. And they did the same thing with us. They put on the birth certificate on us. It's stored on a state level. And the moment FDR seized all registered property, he seized all the registered public U.S. citizens with their sureties, their private citizens. And now he rules us as a conquered people. We are enemies and belligerents living in the states, and the states are considered to be conquered territories. Every American is a public U.S. citizen, which I call a Roman. We're living under Roman government because we have this Roman statutory de facto citizenship put upon us by the Jesuits using their high-level Scottish Rite Freemasons in control of every capital, every state capital in this country. Is this so they got we see such pushback to the sovereign citizen movement when people go to court and try to reclaim their their private citizenship, their sovereignty? Is this why we see them labeled as enemies and uh, is a movement that is being squashed out? Well, it is really, they are enemies. They're doing it all wrong. They need to take my course 
because I teach that what they're saying is you need to be, I'm a sovereign. You're not a sovereign. The only sovereign in the world are kings and queens. The Pope's a sovereign. Uh, that witch, Elizabeth II, she's a sovereign. Um, Queen Beatrix, who gave her now her throne over to her son, she was a sovereign. Now her son's a sovereign. We want to go back to becoming a private citizen under Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. So these people call themselves sovereigns. They're anarchists. And they ought to be treated as such because uh, they're not going back to true de jure 14th Amendment citizenship as I teach in my class because the 14th Amendment broadened and enlarged the old federal citizenship to make it national. It did not create new citizenship. So it's still de jure. And when you become a private citizen, now you have the protection of the Constitution, particularly to a civilian due process of law on a state level with the 14th Amendment and civilian due process on a federal level with the 5th Amendment. It's, it's all about status and process. They cannot give you a martial process if you are, in fact, a private citizen under Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. And that's all they have here today, martial process. So, yes, the sovereign movement is wrong. You can only be, if you, to be a free man, you have to be a private citizen. To be sui juris, you have to be a private citizen. And you can't be any of that if you're a public citizen, because if you're a public citizen, you are owned. You're nothing but an enemy or a belligerent living in an occupied territory, the conqueror, and his agents called judges treat you like that. They treat all the property of the conqueror with belligerency. They're very belligerent, and they're going to tell you the way it is because they're agents for the conqueror, and the whole purpose of the courts is to secure the victory for the conqueror. So this was all done to us by the Pope of Rome, by his Jesuits who run Georgetown University, Fordham University, uh, Loyola in Chicago, Loyola in New Orleans, Loyola Marymount in Baltimore, all the, their 28 major universities in this country. One out of every 10 lawyers is trained by Jesuits in this country. And they put That's upon us number. what I call, it's huge, uh, yeah. it's huge, one out of 10. And uh, then, of course, you have the Jesuits training all their their um, intelligence guys there. You got George J. Tennant Jesuit trained. You got Leon Panetta Jesuit trained. You got Gates Jesuit trained. All the major guys, Peter Pace is Jesuit trained. All the guys in, in positions of power, militarily, and intelligence community have some connection, some way, either through the universities or the CFR to the Jesuit order. All of them. So, uh, in essence, what you've just described here is the history of an internal takeover, or well, of a of a takeover of the United States, and uh, that's correct. Uh, through through uh, and, and their tactics, uh, from what you just described, uh, miseducation. You're talking about perversions, propaganda, political and judicial uh, uh, affectations. Uh, uh, numerous things and the agencies that they control. I mean, they control everything. It's the basis of the power structure here in the United States. And we've got, um, uh, and I know we're up against a break, Joe, uh, but uh, uh, the looking at this and looking at uh, our guest tonight, by the way, folks, is Eric John Phelps, VaticanAssassins.org. But looking at this Vat Vatican uh, Jesuit Masonic Network, um, operations. We often talk about the city of London. You've heard us talk about that. And, and the base of operation there, Vatican City, Rome, in Italy, and of course, our capital, the District of Columbia, which, uh, by the way, and one of the shows I did earlier, I had mentioned about the, uh, the District of Columbia, formerly called Rome. But, uh, uh, that's what, that's uh, just, go, excuse go ahead, sir. That's what Justin Fulton called it in his great book. He called it Washington in the Lap of Rome. Called Rome in the Potomac. Yeah, and in the yep. uh in reading some of the books uh, pre dating uh the founding of America, it talks about uh it frequently references the spirit of Rome, which says it was looking for a home and and how they have found it through their new country which they hope to establish through America and that they did. Uh, Brother Eric, we're going to take the top of the hour break right now. Um, it'll be just a few minutes, a quick word from our sponsors, and we'll be right back after these short messages, folks. You're listening to the Hagman and Hagman Report. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Hagman and Hagman Report on this Wednesday, July 9, 2014, with a very special guest, Mr. Eric Phelps. Uh, Mr. Phelps, I'm going to open this hour with a question uh, from a listener, Betty. She asks that uh, what... Bible is the may, 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 may I inter may I interrupt just for one second to Absolutely. clarify something? You had the advertising of Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise on there with that movie A Few Good Men. Right? Yeah. That was our opening, yes. 
Both Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise are Knights of Malta. Interesting. Uh-huh. No, okay. Just to be clear now, what's the significance? Knights of Malta? Um, it, 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 I, I mean, I, I don't want to sound naive here, but in the context of Hollywood, what's the significance there? What is their influence? The, they run Hollywood. There are certain notable Masonic Jews, but the Knights of Malta run Hollywood as told what to do by the Jesuits. Uh, the, the, you have you have former very uh, influential knights like Frank Capra. He was a knight of Malta. You have uh, certain actors that are knights today, like Al Pacino, like uh, 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 what's his name? Um, oh, Al Pacino. Bishop, you have a uh, you Bishop Sheen. Oh, Bishop Sheen. He's talking about Hollywood. He's talking about Hollywood. Uh, talking about Hollywood. Yeah. Hollywood, yeah. Knight of Malta, you got Anthony Quinn, the old Anthony Quinn actor. You got Anthony Hopkins, he's a Knight of Malta. You got Robert wow. De Niro, he's a Knight of Malta. Uh, Al Pacino, um, you have all these different Knights of Malta that are Hollywood actors. Yeah. Now, Busy uh, serving the are, are you, are, are, Is a person, for example, let's say Jack Nicholson, would, does he get tapped on the shoulder and say, hey, uh, we, we want to induct you into our organization, the Knights of Malta, or how does that work? That's exactly how it works. You have to be invited. Okay. Like and, Ken Horowitz, he's another knight of Malta. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, he sued okay. me. He sued me publicly for making it quite public. He didn't succeed, thank God. But uh, uh, he's a knight of Malta, busy serving the Pope of Rome. Okay, and, and that's the oath they take. Then is it's my understanding as a knight of Malta, that's right. which you have. Your, can you explain that? Doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter which branch, be it an Orthodox branch, the Protestant branch, no matter what branch it is, all this, the, the members of the Order of St. John of Jerusalem are all go back to Blessed Gerard. Blessed Gerard is considered the founder of the Knights of Malta in what, 1048, and the first crusading order to take Jerusalem away from the Muslims. These Knights of Malta are all dovetail in being controlled by the Pope of Rome, regardless of their title. So you always have to be looking and say, who's the knight here? Who's the knight there? And that will show you where the power structure is. Okay. Interesting how you, how you pull back the covers of this. Okay, good. That's correct. Uh, That's exactly yeah. right. Mm-hmm. And, and and before Joe, before you ask your question, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just going to insert this here because when we're talking about the Jesuits and the Knights of Malta, the Knights of Malta, uh, would you, by the way, would you consider them the enforcement arm of the Jesuits, or uh, how would you describe them? They're one of the enforcement arms. Uh, Rupert Murdoch's a Knight of Malta. He's also a knight of the equestrian order, which is even higher than the Knights of Malta. Um, yes, they're enforcement. They're in law. They're in law. Edward Bennett Williams, the former mayor of uh, you know, former huge attorney in Washington D.C. LBJ wanted to make him mayor of Washington D.C. He refused. But J. Edward Bennett Williams was the owner of the uh, Washington Redskins and the Baltimore Orioles. Uh, there's a man. There's a book you want to read called The Man to See. The Man to See. It's about the life of Edward Bennett Williams. Uh, huge man of power in Washington during the Kennedy assassination and under LBJ. But you want to make all these connections with the Knights of Malta because the Knights of Malta were submitted by the Jesuits to their order when the Knights were driven out of Malta when the Napoleon invaded in 15, 16, 1798, kicked out the Knights, drove the Grand Master into Russia, and they went into a secret deal with the, with the Jesuit general in Russia at the time. And from that time forward, the Knights of Malta have always been the most obedient servants of the Jesuits and the Roman papacy that they will control. Very interesting. Okay. And that when... Um Mr. Phelps, when we talk about the Illuminati, for example, uh, and the different families, Rockefellers, Rothschilds, and the, the various bloodlines, are, are, are we talking, is, is the Jesuits, uh, the, the, is the organization itself, the Jesuit organization, is that uh, interchangeable with the Illuminati, or is that uh, over the Illuminati, or, or within it, or incestuous within the Illuminati, or, or how does that work? The Jesuits started the Illuminati. They're the creators of it. Because the Jesuits were suppressed by the Pope in 1773, so they had to go underground. They were kicked out of Bavaria, where they had their uh, where they had their Ingolstadt College and Ingolstadt University now. One of the professors of canon law was Adam Weishaupt. Adam Weishaupt was no Jew. He was a German Roman Catholic professor of 
Roman canon law that taught the supremacy of the Pope in spiritual and temporal matters. So the Jesuits started the Bavarian Illuminati, and I have, in my PowerPoint, I show that there was not one Jew that was a member of the Illuminati when it was founded, according to uh, Professor Robinson in his great work um, written in 1798, uh, concerning this conspiracy that he wrote about. Uh, I have a side of my PowerPoints, but there was not one Jew who was in the Bavarian Illuminati at the time. So they started the Illuminati for the purpose of inciting the French Revolution to overthrow the King of France, because the King of France had kicked the Jesuits out of France, as well as the King of Portugal and the King of Spain, and then to then launch a huge crusade, a, a huge war in Europe using Napoleon Bonaparte to further destroy the, the, the wonderful Protestant Reformation. They're going to destroy the Protestant Dutch Republic in 1795 with Napoleon. They're going to destroy the Republic of Venice, the beautiful Republic of Venice that was in sympathy with the Reformation. They're going to destroy that in 1797 with Napoleon. They're going to do everything they can to set back the Reformation while restoring the Pope's temporal power and killing heretics and liberals for, for liberals rules pursuant to the Council of Trent. So that's the, that's the Bavarian Illuminati. The Illuminati, if the, the, the Rothschilds were nothing more than the keepers of the Vatican Treasury during the 18th century for a while. Now the Rothschilds are as nothing compared to the financial power of the Aldobrandinis, of the Colonas, of the Farnesis, of the of the uh, Several of the major families I have listed on my website, the 10 most powerful families, they're all Italian, Roman Catholic, gray Jesuits, and they control the giga trillions. So the Rothschilds and Rockefellers are all subject to the Jesuits and other papal knights. They are not the power that the Patriot Movement tells you about. That's all a, a ruse of war to get you off trying to blame the Jews, when in fact it's the papacy and the Jesuits that are the problem. Interesting, and that's a big problem I see, is this misdirection and mis, really a miseducation, uh, educational uh, uh, problem of the alternative media, and especially they'll grab onto this, um, they'll focus on this Jewish cabal, this really, and we've, we've done a lot of research, of course, and, and uh, that's nothing more than, uh, to me, an uh, 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 anti-Semitic red herring. Uh, away from the real power structure. Okay, good. All right. That's 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 always what they do. Pope Clement the uh, Innocent the Third. Pope Innocent the Third was a master in redirection and blaming the Jews for the problems of Europe. And it's the same modus operandi they do today. That's why they put a Jew at the head of the Federal Reserve Bank. That's why they put a Jew at the head of the Treasury. So when everything crashes, they can blame the Jews. When the judges of Georgetown and and Fordham run everything. Fall guy. Okay. It makes okay. perfect sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And I got that. I got the sense of this when I was going through your your, your book and reading it, um, uh, folks. I'm, I'm going to tell you something. If you want an education, this encyclopedia of the real uh, structure, power structure, VaticanAssassins.org. Uh, I'm a proponent of this. I, I mean, folks, I I own a copy of this, a digital copy of Vatican. Assassins, and I would urge our listeners, if you want to really get into it, go to VaticanAssassins.org and um, uh, click on the download button. It's inexpensive for the amount of information you get. This will keep you busy for the rest of the summer, I believe. Joe, you, you had a, a, I interrupted you with a question. Or, um. Yeah, uh, we have a, a question from Betty, and this is getting back to the basics. Uh, they have uh, you. What Bible is the true word of God in Jesus Christ, which has not been manipulated? Thank you, and God bless, Betty. Okay. Well, Betty, the Bible that you want to read if you're an English-speaking person is the AB 1611 Reformation King James Bible. That's it. It's the epitome of the English Bibles. It's superior, vastly superior to the Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible has some nice notes in it, and I recommend it, but the translation is far superior to the Geneva Bible. They both use essentially the same Greek text. The Greek text of the AB 1611 was what, the fifth edition of Theodore Beza. So, But it's the Reformation text that we came out of Constantinople when the Muslims took Constantinople. The Byzantine text was driven west into Europe. Erasmus is the first to put it out. Luther uses the Erasmus text for his Luther Bible. And ultimately, in the AB 1611, when the 47 learned and godly men did their translating, they used the Ben Chaim Hebrew text. 
not Biblica Hebraica, and they use the the, uh, the the Byzantine text, also called the Texas Receptors, the majority text, the received text, which was uh, B. Theodore B's fifth edition, which is a combination of, of Stephen's and uh, and Beza's text. So it's the Word of God in English. There are places that need clarification. But it's the place that God, I don't mean correction, I mean clarification. But it's the book God has blessed for the last 400 years. It's been taken to the ends of the earth. Over 60 or 70 translations have been made for that text. When the Reformation was prospering in the 19th century, was going great. And it was the age of the Philadelphia church. The AV 1611 Bible was everywhere. And the Jesuits knew if they, could, if they, could, if they were to overthrow the British Empire, they had to overthrow the AV 1611 Bible. And if they were to overthrow the American Republic, and bring that into an empire, they had to overthrow the AV 1611 King James Bible. Interesting. Thank you for that answer, and thanks for entertaining that question. When sure. we talk about, you know, we're talking about globalism here, and, and we're seeing things happen all around us at breakneck speed, in my view. And, of course, uh, during the last 200 years, and in particular the last 100 years, uh, we've seen, at least based on what I've read uh, from your work, we've seen the power of this Vatican Masonic network uh, covertly being increased tremendously um, through uh, various social, technological policies, industrialization, uh, uh, political and religious globalization. And the, the major goals, as I understand it, 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 again, referencing your work, is um, globalization and um, uh, collectivism uh, of ideology, centralization of, uh, well, centralized socialism, for example, communism, fascism, sure. um, you know, all of this. And, and, and we're seeing this and, and by, by way of occultism and using, and, and this is something, folks, that, uh, and, I, and I'm going to be quiet and let Mr. Phelps continue, but uh, one thing that really fascinated me, again, uh, citing Mr. Phelps' voluminous work um, is the uh, how we talk about, and Tom Horner, our guests, talk about, uh, for example, the obelisks in, in Washington, Rome, and and, and other locations and, and their symbology in the meta and, and of course how a lot of Western rituals and festivals uh, have been uh, really laden with occult meanings, many of which strongly influenced by ancient Rome and Roman Catholic uh, Vatican culture. So uh, I'm going to let you go ahead and continue. We're going to let you continue on with uh, with your presentation. Take us where you want to take us, uh, uh, we say, you know, uh, at this point. Okay. Um, let me think. Okay. Um, I'll take you where the Jesuits where the Jesuits have their power structure. Uh, their their uh, headquarters is in what's called Borgo Santo Spirito, number five in Rome. It's just outside Vatican walls. Their headquarters is a military headquarters. It's guided by it's guarded by missiles, and it's guarded by an army. A small army of highly armed, highly trained knights of the equestrian order. So it is a military power that is really overseeing what's going on in the Vatican. They, um, in turn, they have their great mother church, quote unquote, the Yesu, G E S U, in a little square called the Piazza del Yesu in Rome, the Plaza of Jesus in Rome. In that square is not only the Church of Jesu, which is the the heart of Jesuitism there in Rome as far as their church is concerned, but in that same plaza we have the international headquarters for Scottish Rite Freemasonry. The international headquarters. So the Jesuits run all high-level Scottish Rite Freemasonry, and F. Tarper Saucy was right, even though he was a Jesuit coadjutor working for him, he was right when he said the G in the center of the compass in the square stands for Yesu, G-E-S-U, of the Jesuits. So they run Scottish Rite Freemasonry. Rome is the center city for all religious and political power. Many of the American senators have homes, have, have nearly live in Rome. Ron Paul's been to Rome 50 times. Ron Paul, some of his dearest friends are Roman Catholic priests. Ron Paul's a traitor. He has no intention of ever being a true patriotic American and nationalist. 
So what we have is they run it all. And, and their center city in Rome is a great haven for the visitors of men of power in this country. I got a picture of Newt Gendrick. <laughs> Newt Gendrick, another papal knight, who was a Baptist and turned Catholic because he married his wife. She, she's a Roman Catholic. Sons are trained by Jesuits. I got Newt Gendrick sitting next to Benny Hinn in the Vatican. <laughs> They're all working together for the Pope. Millionaires. So their center of power is there. When Pope John Paul II died, there were 150 heads of state in Vatican City paying respects, quote-unquote, to the Pope. What for? Because he was their master. He was their Caesar. Doesn't matter what religion they were either. That's the kind of power they have. They control the intelligence community. They can eliminate any head of state on an order of the Jesuit general within 48 hours. Who is the so, the Jesuit general? Is the is the Pope uh, the Black Pope or the Jesuit Pope the Black Pope? Yes, he's a Black Pope. The present Jesuit general is Adolfo Nicholas. He's a Basque yeah, from Spain. He's highly trained in the martial arts. He speaks perfect Japanese without an accent. He was a provincial in the Far East, and I maintain that the reason why the former general resigned after 25 years uh, it was Peter Hans Kovenbach. Uh, he was a, a provincial in the Middle East. He was the provincial over Beirut, Damascus, and Cairo. And I maintain the reason why they have, it's almost a dual Jesuit generalship, is because when they foment this huge war, it's going to be huge in the Far East, and that's Adolfo Nicholas's expertise. And it's going to be huge in the Middle East, which is Peter Hans Kolbenbach expertise. So they will be able to orchestrate the wars, orchestrate the armies, orchestrate the generals to do the killing that they want to take place. It will be all under their control. So this is – of late is, is really a um, – well, what the entire world is witnessing or what's happening before our eyes. We may not be seeing it, but it's taking place – is the movement of the grand chess pieces within the powers of the Jesuit order. Is that a fair statement? That's correct. That's a very fair mm. statement. Remember, the Jesuits run the government of Russia. They run the through the through the NK through the uh, FSB and SBR. They run the government of the United States through the CIA, FBI, uh, NSA, Department of Homeland Security. They run the government of Israel through the Mossad, Shin Bet. They run the Arab countries through their various different intelligence communities. They all work together. All the heads of state work together. If you've got a disobedient head of state, like Muammar Gaddafi, we're going to kill him. And we'll put somebody else at the head of that country. Somebody wants to build their country and become a nationalist and, and want to bring wealth into your country, we're going to kill them. We can't have any country prospering for the benefit of their people. Uh, we're going to kill the Serbs, too, because you see the Orthodox Serbs, they're really an enemy. They're an absolute enemy of the Roman papacy. So we're going to use Jesuit claim, uh, train Bill Clinton to bomb the Orthodox Serbs for 77 days. And it goes on and on and on. Now they're fomenting a war in Ukraine. And what do they want? They're, they're creating the alignment between Russia and China to be the enemies of the West. And the Pentagon at this very moment is planning a two-front war with China and Russia in the East and the Middle East and the West. They're planning it. They know they're not going to win because it will ultimately bring down the country. But with traitors like Leon Panetta, that night of Malta, from the Jesuit Santa Clara University in California, with uh, other traders like like uh, like uh, like George J. Tenet, who's another knight of Malta, Mr. Slam Dunk George J. Tenet, he's uh, the one behind uh, causing the war in in Afghanistan. And then you got L. Paul Bremer, L. Paul Bremer the third is not only CFR, but he's also another knight of Malta and Jesuit brother. He's the one that creates the whole um, opposition in Iraq. He creates the ins insurgency in Iraq when he does away with the Iraqi guard. Your listeners must watch the tremendous video. The video, no end in sight. And it's a complete indictment of L. Paul Bremer of what he did there. L. Paul Bremer is an out of Malta. George W. Bush, the this bonesman, will give the Presidential Medal of Freedom to L. Paul Bremer, George J. Tenet, and the invader of Afghanistan, Tommy Franks. And they invaded the Afghanistan. By the way, we cannot forget this. They invaded Afghanistan on October 7, 2001. October 7th is a very important day for the Roman papacy because it was on October 7th, what, 1591, I believe, that the Battle of Lepanto raged and the Knights of Malta with their ships 
defeated the Ottoman Turks, and thereby opened up Jerusalem to Europe. The Battle of Lepanto is considered to be the second most important naval sea battle, second only to the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. And so the Battle of Lepanto was fought on October 7th. Well, I will start the invasion of Afghanistan on October 7th. Uh, dates, numbers, they all mean things, don't they? Absolutely. Here, I'll, I'll give you another one. March 9th, 1933. Well, March is the third month. Nine is nine, so that's three and nine is 12. You got 33, you add three and three for 33. So you got 12, you got 15 with another three, then you got 18. 18 divided by three is six, 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 three sixes. They were waiting for March 9th for a long time. And I have a fellow researcher that said to me, when they passed the Emergency Banking Relief Act on March 9th, 1933, there was a hullabaloo in the house. All this noise and yelling and partying. Finally, the Speaker of the House said, you need to quiet down up there. We're going to have to clear the gallery. The Jesuits had a party on March 9th, 1933, because that's when they took this place for the Pope. And they did it on their occult numbering system that they love to use, which is Kabbalah. And that's still in use today. Absolutely. I mean, uh, They're the masters of Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. and, and by Kabbalah, you're, are you talking about the the Madonna uh, Kabbalah, you know, the infamous That's Madonna's correct. System? Same okay. thing. Roman Catholic Madonna. That's right. Interesting. The Virgin. Okay. Mm -hmm. Preoccupation mm. with the Virgin. We have the same preoccupation with the Virgin, with a woman, with the Borg of Star Trek. The Borg of Star Trek are half human, half machine. They're dressed in black. And the, the Borg is, or is the Jesuit order because it's named after Borgo Santo Spirito, the, uh, Latin for the village of the Holy Spirit. That's the headquarters for the Jesuits in Rome. So naturally, Gene Roddenberry would name his, his Jesuits the Borg. <laughs> and the head of the Borg would be a woman. And they would travel in a black box, a black block. Just like the Masonic Freemasons, with every station is a black ashlar stone. I got a, uh, there's a cemetery of all these Jesuits over here at Novitiate here in uh, Warnersville, and they put a new display up, and every Jesuit is portrayed as a black block on the wall with no name. It's just a huge phalanx of, of a military arm with no name, no faces, just working to the same end for the Jesuit general. Wow. Okay. This is absolutely incredible. Incredible information. Folks, you're listening to Eric John Phelps, his website, VaticanAssassins.org. That's VaticanAssassins.org. Uh, be prepared to spend some time there. Uh, what a fantastic resource. And, of course, you can hear, you, as you hear right now, uh, I feel we bring the best guests with the best information to you. Um, and this is certainly a flagship ship example of that, Mr. Phelps. Uh, that is, in his website and his book, Vatican Assassins, a marvelous resource of information. Um, so, so, go if ahead. We could bring it to, go ahead. Let me, let, me yeah, give you, uh, let me give you another example of the power of these secret societies all working together. There's probably no greater example than the Bush family. Prescott Bush Sr. was a bonesman. And I maintain a Knight of Malta, too, because he was working with Fritz Thiessen in the building of the German army. And Fritz Thiessen was a very powerful Knight of Malta in Europe, one of the richest men in Europe. You have Prescott Bush Sr. We've reviewed him. Prescott Bush Sr.'s, uh, Prescott Bush has a son, Prescott Jr. He's a Knight of Malta. He's the brother of George Herbert Walker Bush, Bonesman. George Herbert Walker Bush has a son, George W. He's a Bonesman. He has another son, Jeb Bush. Jeb Bush is a fourth degree Knights of Columbus, who, with my contacts that I have in Miami, says that he runs the entire drug trade in Miami. So the Knights of Columbus, Skull and Bonesman, Knights of Malta, all in the same family, all working together. Wow. Folks, think about that. And listeners, please, I mean, I. I it's not like I have to really urge you, but really contemplate the significance of what Mr. Phelps is saying here and the significance of, 
of these secret societies that that are really calling the shots. It, it, it's it's really theater. What we our, our reality is theater, and what Mr. Phelps is explaining is really the power structure behind the theater. Yeah. The uh, <laughs> pulling the strings. Yeah. Wow. Now, let me give you another example. You got John Boehner, who's supposedly an enemy of. Barry Davis Obama, his real name is Barry Davis. His father was Frank Marshall Davis, a notable communist in, in Chicago. So I call him Barry Davis Obama. Barry Davis Obama was trained by Jesuits in Chicago. The foremost Jesuit that was his mentor was Greg Galuzzo of the Gamaliel Foundation. Of course, we've got to make it look Jewish now, so we're going to name it after Jew, Gamaliel. When a Jesuit founded it named Greg Galuzzo. Greg Elizabeth will be the tutor of Barry Davis Obama. Another one of his tutors will be Zbigniew Brzezinski. Zbigniew Brzezinski is a Polish Knight of Malta, beloved of the Jesuits at Georgetown and other Jesuit universities in this country. He is a true papal knight and man of power. Zbigniew Brzezinski was one of the founders and creators of Al-Qaeda. He was a personal friend of bin Laden before he died uh, shortly after 9-11. So you have that connection. Now you have Barry Davis Obama. He's controlled by the Jesuits. And his real master, the real president, is that white devil, uh, Joe Biden. He has two honorary degrees from the Jesuits. One from St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia. The other from Scranton University here in Pennsylvania, both in Pennsylvania, to the, to the disgrace of my state. He's the real master. He's the one that's right at the right hand of Obama whenever he signs any law into effect. He's a Roman Catholic Jesuit. Now you have Obama, you have Biden, and now you have John Boehner. John Boehner is supposedly the enemy of Obama, and he's going to sue Obama. That's all smoke and mirrors. Oh, John Boehner is a fourth degree knight of Columbus. John Boehner is the one responsible for getting a Jesuit. I believe it's Patrick Conway. Patrick Conway as the chaplain of the House of Representatives. So they control both sides. You got Jesuits like Lawrence O'Donnell with what MSNBC, and you got Jesuits like Chris Matthews with MSNBC, who was the who was the uh, uh, the the, uh, the um, what do you call him, a journeyman, the apprentice for Patrick Monahan of New York. Patrick Monahan was a great professor and loved by the Jesuits of Ford, and Patrick Monahan was involved in the Kennedy assassination cover up. So Chris Matthews knows this; he was his right hand man. And now Chris Matthews was put at the head of MSNBC. He was a good socialist, good communist, like all most Roman Catholics are socialist communists. They hate the idea of free enterprise, and they love monopolies for the rich. And so you got Chris Matthews, you got Lawrence O'Donnell there, and then that's on one extreme, the left, quote unquote, and then on the right, what do you have? You have Roman Catholic Sean Hannity on Fox News. You got Roman Catholic Bill O'Reilly on Fox News, looking out, looking out for you. Yeah, right. Rupert Murdoch, the head of it all, Knight of the Equestrian Order, Knight of Malta, Knight of St. Gregory. They control both factions, and neither faction will ever raise up a president that will terminate Proclamation 2040. Never. That would be their death sentence. And I maintain Kennedy was going to do that because he said, we don't have a Pax Americana. What's that? It's an empire, American peace, world peace. How do you do that? You've got to have a conqueror. You've got to have a Caesar in place. He was saying there's probably not going to be a Caesar anymore because he was probably going to terminate Proclamation 2040. And that's when they terminated him in Dallas at 1230, uh, November 22nd, 1963. So you have that issue. And then the other thing, you'll never have a Congress that's going to repeal the Emergency Banking Relief Act. 12 United States Code 95A. They'll never repeal it because if they repeal that act and they repeal Proclamation 2040, that's the end of military government in this country. And they'll make very sure they're not going to do that. No Republican and no Democrat would ever raise their voice to call for such things. They know that would be a death sentence. This is fascinating. Um, you, you mentioned the Kennedy assassination. Of course, there, therein lies perhaps the biggest motive for the assassination then is is that yeah. because I, I i read this in your book but for the listeners if you want to just get into the kennedy assassination a bit uh, for the listeners uh and, and folks uh, his book vatican assassins um uh, mr phelps does lay out some pretty interesting details with respect to that but if you want to touch on that uh, uh sure, once again sure. to, just to drive that point home Sure. You can only understand the Kennedy assassination in light of Francis Cardinal Spillman. He was the most powerful churchman in this country at that time. 
Spellman was beloved of Pope Pius XII. Spellman was a Knight of Malta. He was the head of the American branch of Knights of Malta out of St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. Remember, St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York is right across the street from Rockefeller Center, filled with CIA boys, run also by the Knights of Malta. Remember, Alan Dulles was a Knight of Malta. Uh, Tennant was a Knight of Malta. Uh, P- Panetta was a Knight of Malta. There, I count at least six Knights of Malta that were heads of the, heads of the CIA in the past. Uh, William Colby, who they killed because he became disobedient. Um, so what they, 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 Francis Cardinal Spellman was a man of power, the man of power in this country from St. Patrick's Cathedral. Well, Kennedy couldn't stand him. Kennedy would not allow Spellman to say mass in the White House. <laughs> um, remember, Francis Cardinal Spellman after World War II is the most powerful man in this country. He's the controller of MacArthur. He's the controller of Eisenhower. He's the controller of Walter Beadle Smith, the first head of the CIA, an arch traitor. And Patton so couldn't stand a Walter Beadle Smith that he refused to allow Walter Beadle Smith to be a pallbearer in his funeral. And instead, Patton made sure that his black sergeant, Sergeant, sergeant Meeks, would be his pallbearer in place of Walter Beadle Smith. So, what we have is all these men of power, and they're controlled by Francis Cardinal Spellman. Spellman is in control of the CIA. He's in control of the NSA. Uh, he's one of the first guys to be taken out by General Vandenberg after the Roswell crash of the of the uh, of the uh, anti gravity craft that crashed back there, which is of course an American craft built of Pyrex from Corning out of New York. So he's overseeing all of this, and Spell and Kennedy is his enemy. Kennedy wants to do away with the Vietnam War. Kennedy called, uh, the Vietnam War was called back in the 1960s, Spelly's War, Cardinal Spellman's War. Spellman visited the troops in 1965 and called them, get this, called them the soldiers of Christ. You can read all of this in The American Pope by John Cooney. The American Pope by John Cooney, written in 1988. He has the Al Smith dinner every year when he invites all the men of power in finance and military and politics. They're all there at the Al Smith dinner. All the big knights, all the big bankers, all of them are there. That's why both presidential candidates are there. Uh, that's why you got the, courts, the Pope's court Jews there like Chucky e. Schumer and all the other sinners busy serving the Pope of Rome. Lap dogs for the for the for the archbishop there to do whatever he tells them to do, like taking your guns and have a more socialist communism, and more anti-white uh, legislation to destroy the white uh, people in this country, particularly the Protestants and Baptists, to drive us to desperation into right-wing fascism. All this is a design of the Roman papacy. And at the time, Spellman is pushing it because he's also behind the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement was utter treason to the black people of this country. It was led by Roman Catholic, it was led by um, high-level Freemasons like A. Philip Randolph, who founded the, the uh, Sleeping Car Porters. A. Philip Randolph was controlled by Jesuit John Lafarge. And I sell a book by a dear black lady uh, on my website who, who tells the whole terrible story of the civil rights movement. Martin Lucifer King doing nothing but only getting the black people into commerce and into the military to fight for the purposes of the Pope. That's all he was about. So we have Spellman. He's behind us. Spellman is a member of the Urban League in, in, in New York. Uh, Spellman is overseeing the civil rights movement with, with these Masonic Jews, Stanley Levinson, that are, that are advising uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, Spellman is the head of the FBI through, through 33rd degree Freemason J. Edgar Hoover and Hoover's secret boss, who was Carthage Deloach, who was a high-level Knight of Malta, and he was also the head of Division 5 at the time of the FBI's uh, Kennedy assassination. So you have Spellman running Henry Luce. Henry Luce was an Ida Malta. He controlled Time magazine. He's the one that bought the Zapruder film for $150,000. Cardinal Spellman is a personal friend and overseer of Knight of Malta, Lee Iacocca. Lee Iacocca was the head of Dearborn Division of Ford Motor Company at the time of the Kennedy assassination in 63. And what does Iacocca do? He has his chief of security, Carl Renas, drive the limousine back to a Cincinnati uh, Ford dealership to repair all the primary strikes. Lee Iacocca is a traitor. He's also involved in the Kennedy assassination, and he's never been confronted with it, except in my book. So you have Spellman running all these Knights of Malta. He runs Clay Shaw, the head of the trademark in New Orleans. 
He, he runs um, William F. Buckley of the Firing Line. He's a Knight of Malta. He runs um, uh, John McCone, who's a Knight of Malta and head of CIA. Uh, he runs Claire Booth Luce, the Dame of Malta, who was an ambassador to Italy under the Eisenhower administration. He, uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower was a Knight of Malta. He wrote the book Crusade in Europe, and that's all it was, a huge crusade for the Pope. He, uh, he controls... Um, Oh, yes, he controls um, one of the heads of, uh, it's going to be a former head of the CIA at the time, uh, William, William Casey. <laughs> Spellman, William Casey is an Ida Malta. James Angleton is an Ida Malta. And they're all controlled by Francis Cardinal Spellman. So when Kennedy gets out of line, Spellman gives the word. And an order goes wow. down for his assassination. And it's going to go through the Pentagon. What about the Pentagon? The Pentagon was built by a huge Philadelphia contracting business owned by a Knight of Malta named John McShane. John McShane. So all of it's in the hands of the Pope. Kennedy says, I'm not going to obey Spellman. I'm going to get us out of Vietnam by 1965. Fletcher Prouty writes his great work, JFK, of which the movie is based upon largely a lot of that. And... Uh, Spellman says, no, you're not. You're not pulling all these troops out. we got a bunch of things to accomplish there in Nam. So for that and also Kennedy, he attacks the Pope's Federal Reserve Bank. He wants to take the Federal Reserve notes out of circulation. He wants to circulate nearly $6 billion worth of uh, United States notes. And so what happens is he's assassinated about one or two days after the assassination. LBJ uh, reverses the executive order of Kennedy for all the United States notes to be circulated. LBJ was totally controlled by Spellman. Uh, LBJ's best friend was a Roman Catholic priest, Winnebald Snyder. LBJ's personal friend in Washington, Edward Bennett Williams, who became the head of the Knights of Malta in America for a time. LB, Billy Graham. Billy Graham was the personal friend of LBJ and J. Bennett, uh, Edward Bennett Williams, and Billy Graham is a traitor. Another dirty, filthy traitor, a 33rd degree Freemason working for the Pope of Rome. And I hope and pray someday that somebody really comes out and exposes him for his hand in the Kennedy assassination. So you have all these knights involved, but they're all subject to Francis Cardinal Spellman. And right over here at the Jesuit Spiritual Center, there was a novitiate at the time. Francis Cardinal Spellman had a special room called Room Number 3. And there he would go meet with the Jesuits of Power of the Maryland Province and be told what he needs to do. Spellman, after the assassination of Kennedy, refused to stay in this country. He goes to Rome and performs a high mass in Rome because he's not sticking around here. And Joe Kennedy knows it, and the Roman, the, the, many of the Roman Catholics know it, and the Kennedys no longer have anything to say to Francis Cardinal Spellman. So Francis Cardinal Spellman oversaw the entire assassination of John F. Kennedy and the cover-up, and the cover-up will continue with Terence Cardinal Cook, and it will continue um, because uh, uh, we have uh, Frank Sturgis. Sturgis was one of the assassins uh, in Dallas. He's going to make a 22-page confession to Terrence Cardinal Cook and tell everything that happened in Dallas that day. And one of the things he tells in his 22-page confession that's suppressed in Terrence Cook's archives there in, in St. Patrick's Cathedral is the fact that the man who killed... Um, uh, 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 Jefferson Davis, what was it, Lee, um, uh, Officer Tippett, Je or Jefferson, Jefferson, uh, Jefferson Lee Tippett, I believe. He kills Officer Tippett. The man who killed Tippett in Dallas was G. Gordon Liddy, the Roman Catholic papal knight, so beloved by J. Edgar Hoover. So you got all these sinners, all these traitors, all these murderers, all these liars running everything in this country, and the pulpits are dead silent. Not a peep from any one of them. John MacArthur, to you name it, none of them. In fact, Kenneth Copeland now is bringing his church back to the Pope of Rome, just like that James Robinson. Those traitors, those evangelical traitors. And what that means is, what that means is a military dictatorship of martial law under a dictator that will have no restraints and limitations, as was Hitler in Germany. So shall we have here. This is our future, is what you're telling me. That's, telling that's us. correct. If there is no great awakening, if God does not send a great awakening like he did send three times before in this country, then we will go down into the dust, the same dust that Germany went down in, in the second 30 years war from 1914 to 1945. They will crush the Reformation out of this country, and they will kill every Jew in North America. They're all slated for death. The Department of Homeland Security is going to invade Canada. Canada will be merged with the U.S. 
and now the roundups will take place just as the Jesuits used their SS to under the Anschluss of 1938 to take in Austria into Germany, and then they will be, that will be a foundation for the roundups, the beginning of the roundups in Germany and Austria, and they're going to do that here, unless there's a great awakening and men start talking about it and doing something about it. Amen to that. Uh, folks, I just want to say this. Um, what you're hearing is really a great, a very precise and, and a concise summary of what's in Mr. Phelps' book, Vatican Assassins. I'm going to tell you something. Um, if you grab that book, uh, download the book, it's five volumes, it'll give you the details. Uh, uh, we're touching on the highlights. We could go, in not three hours, we can go probably for three weeks like this because it is so detailed the research is so precise the reason I'm just telling you this is because it's it's worth it, it, the information is worth having and, and one thing I was very impressed with and then I'm going to uh, show you, you know, turn it to you but one thing I was very impressed with is the level of detailed citations and the um, um, append, uh, uh, the appendices but the um, uh, well the appendices but uh, that's not the word I'm looking for. Uh, that's that's incorporated in this work. It's a it's a marvelous piece of research, and I, I, I'm not here to, to to sell the book, except I, I do recommend it. I'm explaining to you that this, this this subject is so vast, and Mr. Phelps, you know, I, I'm so as you're talking, I could tell this is not something you're you're checking your notes on this is something you've lived and it's coming second nature to you it's just it's a, i'm just amazed by it um I, and i want to thank you for for taking your time out but but, but before we go on before I turn over to joe you you mentioned something here i've got to ask this question why when you mentioned about g gordon letting lydia um reportedly uh killing murdering officer tippett what was the motive behind that Evidently, Tippett was involved in some shady things, drug deals and whatever. He was not a very clean guy. But I'm not sure of all the details. But this, I discovered this through Jim Rothstein, who was a former New York Police Department detective. And he said it on a program that I was on with him, that he knew that Terrence Cardinal Cook had this 22-page confession of Frank Sturgis. Frank Sturgis, he's also used to dress up like a Jesuit, too. That crazy assassin. And uh, Sturgeon, in his confession, according to uh, Jim Rothstein, said that Gordon Liddy did the shooting of Tippett. This is for why I'm sure there was other reasons. They were probably just eliminating evidence. Maybe Tippett knew something. Because remember, there's over 100 assassinations of witnesses. Remember Jim Keith's work, the dead witnesses? Over 100, 100 120 were dead witnesses after the Kennedy assassination because the CIA and the FBI are just busy eliminating any kind of evidence that could be used in a trial. There's no evidence. There's no trial. So they eliminated him. They eliminated uh, Demoren Schultz and others. Demoren Schultz was a night of Malta too. Clay Shaw, they they poisoned him. He didn't have an autopsy. So they eliminate their own if they become a threat to the temporal power of the, of, of the Pope. Wow. And and we we've uh, folks we've had. Um... Uh, others on talking about well the death of this very strange death of Mary Sherman, Doctor Mary Sherman down in, in the, uh, uh, Louisiana, I believe it was yep. New Orleans, yes. yeah. And uh, uh, this is very convoluted uh, to say the least. But okay, so we we've gone through the Kennedy assassination. Of course, Watergate we know is is tightly connected with with the Kennedy assassination of Nixon. Oh, yes. Well, and by right. the way, you mentioned Mary Sherman. I just want to mention something about her. The book your listeners need to get if they don't have it. It's called Dr. Mary's Monkey by Haslam. And yes. a tremendous, fabulous work that he put together. God bless him for it. He has a picture of David Ferry in a Cossack and a Jesuit novitiate. That fact, is something that nobody... Yep. And we've, we've interviewed him on this program. Uh, well, he's uh, a great guy. So... He did a wonderful service. Thank God for him, because he proves the connection of the Jesuits to David Ferry. David Ferry, CIA, and also Mafia. Total Jesuit connection. But he started to talk, so they got rid of him. Yeah. Very interesting. We have a, a number of, of questions uh, 
from listeners and uh, and I guess uh I'll start with this one. This is kind of uh, recent. Um the one listener Annie asked, "Could you please ask your guests about the court finding the queen and the pope guilty of child trafficking?" <laughs> well, Kevin and Nat, um I'm a little concerned about his veracity. However, on the face of what he's doing, he's absolutely correct. The Queen Queen Elizabeth is a dame of Malta. She's a Bilderberger. Um, I have no doubt that she's involved in human sacrifices. All these high nobles are involved in it. I know a noble who told me, Eric, I've eaten human meat. Many of us nobles are cannibals. We eat it. So it's called long. Pork, I have no doubt. By the way. I, uh, Pardon? A long, long, uh, it's referred to, it's my understanding based on my research, which, by the way, is uh, I don't want to go there. It's called long pork, long pork, um, um, long pork. in some circles. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, under, I understand the human flesh tastes like pork. Yeah. But um, in any event, no, the, 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 the queen and the pope work together. Uh, she is subject to him. She does what he tells her to do. That's why you know, all these heads of state always dress in black and the Pope always dresses in white. Is that what her question was? Did I, did I answer that? Um, is, was yeah. that sufficient? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, another question is the uh, relevance of this latest Pope Benedict resigning for Pope France to take the reign uh, having for the first time in 600 years two sitting popes. Yeah. Well, I tend to think that the pope has resigned. Although he probably is influential, because remember he was they called him God God's Rottweiler under John Paul II because he was the head of the Congregation for the Faith, which is the Holy Office of the Inquisition, renamed in 1917, take away the name of the Inquisition. But um, I have no doubt that he's probably influential. But this Jesuit, this uh, Francis the First, this this Italian uh, Argentinian, is a very diabolical man. He's the perfect man to be in that place for the up and coming war that they're going to have in the Middle East, when they're going to destroy Mecca and Medina, and they're going to blame it probably on the Americans or the Iranians. So that the Sunni Muslims will unite for the annihilation of every Shia Muslim on the face of the earth. And then they can unite Sunni Islam for its attack into America. So that's what their major game is. To destroy Shia Islam, destroy Mecca and Medina, and also the Jerusalem mosques in preparation for the building of the third Hebrew temple for the Pope. Because he wants it for himself. They're going to burn everything down, baby. Everything is what you're saying. I'm saying that it's going to be, there will be surgical things because Israel cannot be destroyed. And Jerusalem will still be a city that's populated by Jews. And so there will be a third temple built, but we're going to see a huge war in the Middle East and uh, largely incited by the American diplomacy there that would not allow Israel to take care of its enemies and, and the giving of Gaza to Hamas and the whole nine yards. And Gaza is historically the land of Judah. It belongs to the Jews. And so... This has all been facilitated by this government, this military government here in Washington, subject by the Pope of Rome, working in conjunction with the government of Israel, which also works for the Pope of Rome, especially through Shimon Perez, who is an absolute papal slave, like Benjamin Netanyahu. They both work for the Pope. Man. Folks, we're talking with Eric John Phelps, his website, VaticanAssassins.org. That's VaticanAssassins.org book of the same name Vatican Assassins it's a great it's a great book it's available for download I would urge uh, those people who want to understand how all of this is coming together and, and we're seeing uh, to, 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 by the way to, for me to finish that sentence uh, to go to his website VaticanAssassins.org and in the upper right of course is the uh, download available for purchase now, having said that, um, it's interesting you point out about the Sunni Shia type uh, of antagonism here taking place because the America, uh, I mean, the United States, the Western intelligence, we are backing ISIS and and the uh, which is ISIS. A, created correct and and funding that's correct yes uh, more precise yes um, and, and the name by the way. Um, 
to me is more than <laughs> just a coincidence, is it not? Uh, no, uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, uh, but, but it, it's interesting because just this past weekend there was some significant footage. In fact, I don't even think it made it in the Western media where ISIS had gone into uh, uh, the, uh, I think it was the southwestern uh, or northwestern part of Iraq, southwestern part of, or southeastern part of Syria, and destroyed, I think, a dozen Shiite, long-standing Shiite yes. temples there. That's right. Oh. That's right. And what I maintain, one of their plans is this. Because remember, remember that during the war in Iraq, they were destroying Shiite temples too. Americans under the under the military command of Roman Catholics, subjects of the Pope, were busy also destroying Shia mosques. It's the destruction of Shia Islam before our eyes. Now, I'm not any friend of Shia Islam, but I'm somewhat of a friend of it in that the Pope didn't create it. The Pope created Sunnism. He did not create Shia, and that's always been a thorn in his flesh because he's not able to completely unite Islam until he gets rid of the Shia. And remember, there is no Sunni mosque in Iran. There is no Sunni mosque in Tehran. Only Shia. The Shia are not allowed to go to Mecca or Medina. They're not allowed to make a pilgrimage there. So the hatred between the two groups, all they need is a little incitation. And I maintain this is what I think they're going to do. The ancient city of Sumer. Sumer is the, the oldest city known to man in legitimate archaeological excavation. Sumer has a very sacred Shia mosque in it. And if ISIS goes there, run by the CIA and the Pope, and they go there and they destroy that Shia mosque in Sumer, Iran is going to go ballistic. And Iran may very well counter with the destruction of the mosques in Mecca and Medina because they are not afraid of anything when it comes to war. And they'll gladly go in there as suicide bombers and blow the place up. But I maintain, I maintain there's already a bomb in Mecca and there's already a bomb in Medina. And it's been put there by the high Sunni leaders because the high Sunni leaders are Masons subject to the Jesuits. So when that happens, hmm. now you're going to have the destruction of Mecca and Medina. You're going to have the destruction of Jerusalem mosques. Um, you're going to have the destruction of the ancient Shia mosque in Sumer. You're probably going to have the destruction of the of that uh, Roman Catholic uh, cathedral that's guarded by the Knights of the Equestrian Order that was built by Constantine, uh, what is it called? Oh, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem. And if they bring that down and blame it on the Muslims, then you have the whole Catholic world of Europe wanting to go to war. So all they have to do is press these certain little triggers. And then they can launch their war, and then they'll be controlling the military commanders to have them do what they want them to do. And one of the things they're going to do is they're getting prepared to rebuild a second Sunni caliphate. They're, they've already been rebuilding it now with Dubai and Abu Dhabi. They're building it with Iraq, with Baghdad. They're building it with ancient city of Babylon. I have pictures in my PowerPoints of American troops guarding uh, the ancient city of Babylon. It's, it's being rebuilt. The Ishtar Gate's already been built. They're building Babylon under the guise of a second Sunni caliphate. And when the final Pope of Rome is slain and he rises from the dead to be the Antichrist, he's going to move his capital from Rome to Babylon. And that's why Rome is completely behind it and using American uh, military and American corporations to build a place. That's why they build Baghdad. Yeah, Baghdad is going to be the capital of the new Sunni caliphate. I think it's on 104, 107 acres, the largest American embassy in the world, all going to be given to the Shia Muslims. Brother Eric, uh, we're a couple minutes before the break here, and this might be a good time to ask this question. Um, I received a lengthy email uh, from a Julie, and she states that the Catholic Church is the same church that Jesus founded uh, and made Peter the first pope, basically. It, is the Catholic religion the church that Jesus built? No, Roman Catholicism is not Christian. It's not. It's never been Christian. It's not Christian today, and it never will be. And we know this by what it does. It utterly condemns the reading of the Bible by the common man in his own language. It routinely kills, killed for hundreds of years, Bible believers during the Dark Ages. And they have also done everything they can to suppress the Reformation Bible in the hands of the people. The Lord Jesus Christ of the Scriptures never founded the Roman Catholic institution. It was founded by, by, by the devil, 
using certain powerful men. As I said, I'm not being hateful to the, to the emailer because I know she's Roman Catholic, but she needs to wake up to the fact that Roman Catholicism is not Christian. Their doctrines are salvation by works, and the Bible is very clear. For salvation is by grace through faith, and not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. It's either works or grace. Catholicism, it's all works. Well, thank you very much for that clarification. Uh, very well said okay. and put. And with that, we're going to go to our top of the hour break, Mr. Phelps. Uh, thank you for another jam-packed information hour. We have one hour left with you, and we'll be right back after these short messages to get to that. We're going to go to a break now. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to our third and final hour of this Wednesday, July 9th broadcast of the Hagman and Hagman Report with our very special guest, Mr. Eric John Phelps. Uh, the author of Vatican Assassins, fantastic first two hours. If you have been, if you joined us late, I recommend you download this broadcast and listen to it. I know I'll be downloading it and listening to it several times to catch everything that was said in here because it's so much information and it's going so fast. Uh, Mr. Phelps, I have a, a great question um, from a listener named Elizabeth. She asks, "I'm confused. If all these people that Mr. Phelps is talking about are working together under control." of and for the good of the Jesuits, why are they fighting against each other? Well, it's an open but false policy. We have to realize that the Jesuits have an open but false policy and a secret but true policy. And you have to ask yourself that question. What's the real policy behind this? So who's fighting who? Well, we got ISIS fighting against who? The Shia? Um, they're the targeted population. Who's backing ISIS? The CIA. CIA backs the Muslim Brotherhood. CIA backs uh, Hamas. CIA backs all these these uh, radical, these typical Muslim groups, I should say. They're backing them all to use them for the killing of certain targeted populations. And then the then the, then the Jesuits are going to back the uh, the Russians with their FSB. The Jesuits run Spetsnaz just like they run the Green Beret or the Navy SEALs. So they run all these extremes in this huge Hegelian dialectic for the purpose of targeting selected populations and peoples for destruction or individuals. So openly they appear to be fighting each other. I'll give you an example. World War II. I, my, I'm, chapter 37 of my book has to do with 150 pages of World War II, the Second Thirty Years' War. Here's an example. We have the, the British fighting the Germans, right? Well... The Germans uh, just happened to have the British Expeditionary Force surrounded at Dunkirk, some 350,000 men. And they're waiting for the order to bomb and strafe the British Expeditionary Force and for the Panthers to move in and wipe them out. You know what Hitler does with his high command? He orders his Panthers to stop. And the German high command can't believe it. Why is he not destroying the 350,000 men of the British Expeditionary Force? Because when they're destroyed, we now can invade Britain. And once we invade Britain, take it over, and we can put our wolf pack in the Pacific, and no Americans are going to be shipping anything over here. That's how critical Dunkirk was. You know what happens? The British are allowed to escape back to England because they need time they they need uh, the, the purpose of the war is for the destruction of historic white protestant prussia they're going to destroy prussia by 1946 that's one of their one of their goals they're going to destroy the reformation out of europe we're going to bomb rotterdam to smithereens a tremendous protestant city we're going to firebomb dresden that wasn't a military target and we're going to use the American uh, forces in Bomber Harris with the British. All these factions work together. So Dunkirk is a classic example that you can know Hitler was told by his handler not to take Dunkirk. Let's turn, let's turn the tables here. Let's turn the tables and we'll talk about uh, the invasion on, on uh, D-Day when Normandy is invaded. Remember, the bombs that were dropped at D-Day at Normandy and, and Omaha Beach, they were all dropped in the ocean or they were dropped behind the machine guns and the big guns there on the, uh, on the line. So that when the first Americans get to go in there, they're primarily Protestants from Virginia and Maryland to Pennsylvania. And they're going to be slaughtered like dogs. And they're sorted out because it's all on their dog tags, Protestant, Catholic, Jew. And so they're going to put up this primarily Protestant division for this invasion. They're to be the first invasionary force. Now, when they finally take uh, the, 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 uh, the, the shore there at Normandy, 
and they started to move inland, the German army is surrounded. They got 250,000 Germans surrounded. And Patton is just waiting to close what's called the Falaise Pocket. F-A-L-I-S-E, I I believe. It's the Falaise Pocket. Patton is what goes to Eisenhower, begs to close the Falaise Pocket because if they close the Falaise Pocket, the Germans must surrender or they will be annihilated. Eisenhower doesn't allow Patton to close the pocket. What? They only take 50,000 prisoners. What? 200,000 Germans escape so they can fight the Battle of the Bulge, one of the bloodiest American battles of the war. This was done deliberately because, you see, there were more Jews to kill in the East. And we can't have the Germans defeated right now because we've got to bring another 800,000 or a million Jews to Auschwitz. We've got to get all those Hungarian Jews to Auschwitz. So this is how, when you have two factions, the Battle of Harkin Forest, that was a totally unnecessary battle, a great slaughter of American men. There was no need to have that battle. These are the kind of things that happen in World War II, where you have obvious workings, where the generals are not acting like generals. They're not obeying very basic military protocol to win a battle because they're being told what to do. And this is how you have to look at it. Both sides, they're fighting each other, but I'll tell you at the top, they're not fighting each other. They're only fighting each other on the low level. Same way in the intelligence communities. You've got the low level uh, Soviet, and it's still the Soviet Union. It's not the Russian Federation. You've got the low level Soviet guys killing guys at low level FBI. But at the top, they're all working together. And it makes for a wonderful illusion to keep people constantly guessing what's going on. Fantastic explanation, and having lost, well, an uncle at the Battle of the Bulge, it seems, um, wow. You know, you look at this, you you just look at all of this, um, and I know that we've got got the the three quarters of an hour left, and you've been so generous with your time. Um, If we can bring it forward to... uh, through 9/11 and 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 you know present day, um, can, if you can try to help us make sense of 9/11 and current events and you know m- more recent history um, and, and where we are today, I'd, we'd really appreciate that because we're, we're <laughs> looking at this and try, we're, you know we're desperately trying to sort things out as we look at this new world order agenda being implemented. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, let's let's always keep in mind their goals. Their goals are to destroy the Protestant Reformation out of North America. Remember, the Jesuits were not involved in founding this country. And regardless of what Chris Pinto has to say, and I like Chris, he's a personal friend, but he's wrong. It's the same way with F. Tupper Saucy. He was a liar. And I call him a Jesuit coadjutor. And uh, this whole nonsense that America was founded by the Jesuits is just bogus. Uh, Lorenzo Ricci was not involved at all in the signing of the Declaration of Independence. The first signer was a Protestant named John Witherspoon. And a book that your listeners need to get is titled The Chaplains and Clergy, The Revolution by J.T. Headley. It is a classic you need for your library. It shows you these things. But anyway, what happens now is the Jesuits want to destroy the Protestant Reformation out of this country, which includes the American Constitution, because it's a white Protestant Calvinistic document. It's a Presbyterian document, and the Bill of Rights is a Baptist document. They call it the the First Amendment the Baptist First Amendment, written by Calvinist and Baptist James Madison at the behest of another Baptist Calvinist who was one of Virginia's most influential preachers. His name was John Leland. And so they want to get rid of that. Because the First Amendment is an impediment to the Pope's temporal power. So, this is their end game here. The destruction of historic Protestant government, the destruction of a historic white Anglo-Saxon Protestant people, as well as the blacks, because the majority of blacks are Protestants and Baptists. So they're condemned heretics too. That's why they want to foment a race war between the whites and the blacks. So they kill each other, and after there's enough bloodletting and killing each other, then the Department of Homeland Security can move in and mop up operations, send the rest off to concentration camps, especially that one million-acre concentration camp in southeastern Alaska. 
So that's what they want to do. They want to destroy the Reformation here. It's going to cost probably 150 million people around that amount that they're planning on. And uh, to to ultimately end up with a Sino-Soviet Muslim invasion, as I still show in my book. So that's their end game here. What's the end game in the Middle East? The end game is in the Middle East is to further secure the Latin kingdom of Jerusalem. That's what the Pope calls Israel. Israel is going to prosper from this war. It's going to have borders extended. Because it's the Pope's Latin kingdom of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, in his mind, is his city. And Jerusalem and the Temple Mount was deeded to the Pope in September of 1993. The Pope owns the Temple Mount. 60% of all the land in Jerusalem is owned by the Vatican. 60%. So his revived Latin kingdom of Jerusalem is going to continue to prosper because he waited 600 years for it to be taken out of Muslim hands, which happened in 1917 with Allenby when he took the city. So now, that's what they want. So they're going to extend and, and, and ultimately prosper the revived Latin kingdom of Jerusalem, which is Israel, which I believe the Jews have a right to their land. Don't misunderstand me. It's their land. They have a right to it, but they also have a right to a government that's going to, get benefit for their, going to govern for their benefit, not for the benefit of the Pope. That's why I'm against the government of Israel, but I'm completely for the Hebrew Jewish Israelites living in their own land. And by the way, they're not Khazars either. That's an odd Jesuit Austrian heresy of early 1900s. And you look in vain to find that theory prior to 1900 in any any dictionary. In any Thanks dictionary. for clearing that up. That's a very, very important distinction. Uh, that'll come up in, in emails, I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you for putting oh, yes. that out. Okay. Okay. I, I, I wrote an extensive article on that about five years ago, and you can find it on my website, in my archives. But anyway... Um, that's, that's what's happening, and uh, uh, so that's they're going to extend the borders and, and into Israel, and they're also going to build a second Sunni caliphate. They're also uniting Europe for, for the, under the final pope for the pope. So that means Britain has to lose the pound. It has to be driven to the euro. Uh, Ireland will be entirely in the hands of Rome. Britain will also be, I mean, they've got to do away with the last vestige of the Protestant Reformation, which is Great Britain. So that's what they're working on in Europe. They're working on the same. They've, they've already got Russia. They've already got the Eastern nations. This thing going on in Ukraine between Russia is just to create Russia and China as the enemy of America. Ukraine is already subjugated, uh, but it's just for Western consumption. So the people here will want to fight the Russians for what they're doing in Ukraine. When, when the fact of the matter is, Odessa is Russian, and it should never, uh, with, with, um, uh, it should never have been given to the Ukrainians with uh, Nikita Khrushchev, who was a Ukrainian. So when they come in and they take, uh, uh, they take that portion uh, of land down there, that's actually Russian. But nonetheless, it's all to incite anti-Russian fury here in America. So that they'll ultimately say, we need to fight the Russians. Of course, remember, the whole Russian military has been built by the West. Their technology has come from here, just as the technology for the whole Red Army of China has come from here. That's why they gave all our top secrets to Wen Ho Li, that Chinese traitor working with the CIA, to give it to the Chinese so they can have, so they, uh, so they increased their uh, military abilities by 25 years over Wen Ho Li. And he never was prosecuted, never went to jail, never was executed. So what we have now is this is their end game. The unification of the Asian nations in the Far East under China. That's their big game. So Japan is going to go into the fold of red China. That was the reason why they pulled Fukushima. That was, an, that was a nuclear, that was a, a thermonuclear bomb in, in the Pacific Trench, and it caused the flooding. It wasn't any storm or anything like that. It was, it was a naval operation. And so now that's going to drive Japan into the arms of the Chinese, and that's exactly what they want. And then they're also going to unify Korea. They're going to unify North and South Korea. There will be the, one of the largest armies in the world with North and South Korea combined. They have a huge navy, a huge subfleet. Korea, Taiwan, China, Japan, all of those Asian nations will be united into one huge faction for the ultimate and future invasion of the West Coast and through the Panama Canal, and from the new Panama Canal they're building, and ultimately from the, Panama, from the canal they're going to build through Nicaragua, all into the Gulf of Mexico, so they can go into New Orleans, Miami, and South and Charleston. It's going to be a huge, massive Sino-Soviet Muslim invasion. So that's where they're, where they're working at. So in order to have that here, they have to weaken the population. They have to make sure everybody's on drugs. 
You have to make sure we have this huge dope trade in this country where all the major cities are on dope. I was told when I was in Miami two weeks ago that 75 to 80 percent in Miami, those people are on drugs. So there's drugs everywhere to weaken the population. It's the same game they played on China when the Jesuits were using the British to run the opium trade into China to weaken the Chinese population so they could ultimately overthrow the Manchu dynasty in 1912. So that's the game well here. Flood the place with Make sense? Yep. So flood yep. the country with drugs, flood the country with crime, and also we've got to advocate, we've got to take away the guns now. Now, these people, they can't have guns. And we're going to have more and more crime, more and more black ops, more and more uh, these events like Columbine and others that are military uh, black ops to justify these prostitute congressmen and senators to pass legislation to take your guns. And by the way, they can only take guns from public U.S. citizens. They cannot take the guns from the private citizens, having their private citizenship secured by Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. Because they can only give a private citizen civilian due process of law. They cannot give a private citizen martial process, which is all they give on a federal and a state level. Your listeners is think it, about taking my course. Exactly. But let me ask this. Has that been tried and tested anywhere in the continental or anywhere in the United States? I tested it in Berks County, in Bucks County in Pennsylvania and one there. Okay. Civil, civil it, case. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, it, it, it so, pe- so people can go to your website and, and, and find more information about that, VaticanAssassins.org. They, right. They can find about about the course. If they want to take the course, it's 1750 bucks. Cost takes three days to go through it, all day Friday, all day Saturday, and all day Sunday. They get three large books, and unfortunately, they got to listen to me for about 10 hours a day. But when I'm done, they understand what happened and what to do and how to restore their status. But anyway, and, and, back to what they're doing. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No. So, uh, so back I, to I, what they're doing. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't mean to over-talk you. But there is a little bit of a delay here. Um, to go ahead and continue, sir. Okay. So that's what they're doing. They're uniting the Far East. That's why they use the American... Uh, the American infrastructure to build a huge commercial empire in Japan to ultimately be merged into China to be used against us. That's why they made a pillbox out of Taiwan. There's more munitions in Taiwan than probably any country in the world per capita. They're going to take all those munitions and all those Chinese nationalists, merge them into the Red Army, and they're going to have another huge force there. So it's about merging all the Asian nations that were built in the Cold War, militarized during the Cold War, uniting them to be used against us. Then, uh, they, then also they're ultimately going to be the kings of the east of biblical scripture that will invade Israel, and there's already always there's already a road being built uh, to that end. Then you have the the building of the second Sunni caliphate. That's why they made all these Muslims, these Sunni Muslims, the Wahhabis. They made them rich. They made them rich in Sunni Kuwait and Sunni United Arab Emirates and and, and Sunni Saudi Arabia, all Wahhabis for the most part. So they made them rich so that they can build their second Sunni caliphate. So they've suppressed inventions here, like electromagnetic motors and other wonderful inventions that would take away all the money flowing to those nations that the Jesuits are building. And in Europe, they're building Europe. It's going to be what uh, what do they call it? Chechen? Uh, it's a term, but it's a the huge European Union financially and politically under the Pope of Rome. Well, what about all the Muslims in Europe? Well, that's simple. The Muslims have been brought to Europe to drive those white people in Europe to desperation. So you're going to drive them into right wing fascism, and all those Muslims in Europe are going to die. They're going to kill every one of them. It's like they're going to kill every Muslim in this country. They've been driving the people to desperation here with what they do and their Sharia and what they want to do in the place. You're just driving the average white, frustrated white man into the desperation of right-wing fascism. And all the Muslims in this country are going to die. All the alien Roman Catholic Mexican invaders that have come into this country, they're all going to die. They're all going to concentration camps. When this white power structure in this country is finally brought to power, it's going to be a huge bloodbath. And every Jew, as I I mentioned they're also going to be all rounded up because obviously it's the Jews that did this and they're going to be rounded up and they're going to camps too. So they're go- this, that's what they have planned for here. That's what they have planned for Canada. That's what they have planned for the Far East, the unification there. Russia, they've already got that built. They just use it when they want to. Uh, they've got to add their uniting Africa under a dictatorship in the South. They're going to destroy all the historic white Anglo-Saxon Protestants out of South Africa and out of Rhodesia. They've already done it in Rhodesia. 
a.k.a. Zimbabwe. Rabu Mugabe, the Jesuit-controlled dictator, has killed out and driven out every white man out of Zimbabwe. And the only white men that haven't left that I know of have lions guarding their estates. Lions. So I was talking with a guy with um, Safari International about two years ago. He said, Eric, what happened to Zimbabwe will happen to South Africa within five to ten years. It's over for South Africa and all those white people down there. They're all going to be killed or driven out. And they're not being allowed to go to Europe either. They're being surrounded. They're being closed in there for their death. With the African National Congress controlled by that Jesuit, uh, what's the name, of Zuma, they're going to kill them all. So we're watching white genocide take place in Africa. Furthermore, we're watching not only we're watching black Christian genocide because uh, 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 Idi Amin killed uh, 250,000 black Anglican Christians, and he was Wahhabi Muslim. He leaves. He's driven out of Uganda. Where does he go? He goes to Saudi Arabia and stays there until the day he dies. He fathers 63 children. So all of this wow. is happening for the destru- yeah for the destruction of biblical Protestant Christianity out of Africa and the white race out of Africa. It will it will be all Muslim, and it will be uh, the destruction of the great the great nation of South Africa, the greatest nation in all of Africa, and the greatest city in all of South Africa, Johannesburg, which is now the rape capital of the world. So yeah, I, that's I just what's happening. To see. In the world. I just happened to see a documentary about that, uh, about the um, uh, uh, this this enormous upsurge, uptick in 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 uh, rapes, and we're we're not talking just rape, but I mean I'm talking some serious issues in South Africa, uh, um, the uh, unspeakable horrors taking place. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you about one of them. What these black savages do, these black communist savages working with the Jesuits and the ANC, they'll go to these white women, break in their houses, they'll strip them, they'll put oil on them, they'll break out the iron, and they'll iron every square foot of their skin and burn them. And then after they're done burning them, they take turns gang raping them. And after they finish gang raping them, then they kill them. That happens all throughout South Africa. But we can't know about that because, you see, reporting something like that, why, that would be racist and prejudice, you see. Reporting the truth. Wow. Yeah, and I can attest to what you just said um, in the uh, – this is a foreign documentary. As a matter of fact, I think it was uh, – uh, I'm not sure who produced it, but exactly what you described – uh, in in very vivid detail, it, it was it was absolutely horrific, and I had mm-hmm. to double check to make sure I wasn't watching some sort of propaganda piece. But it's not. So mm-hmm. what we're seeing when you when you reference uh, black on white, white on black, regardless, you're, you're you're we're seeing an orchestrated race war, regardless of. That's right. Uh, no, 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 no. It's an orchestrated it's an orchestrated race war against the white Protestants. And even John Coleman rep- mentions this in his Committee of 300, the, distru- the, the war on the historic white Protestant peoples. That's exactly what's going on against the white peoples in England. you got all those majority savage Muslims there. They're busy making pores out of those white women there, pouring hot boiling water on right. their little children. That's all Muslim savagery encouraged by the Masons that are running those people for the benefit of the Pope and destroying the historic white Protestants of England and Scotland. Right, and John Coleman does. Dr. Coleman does document that. Now he's up in years right now, but he does document that very, very well on Committee of Three Hundred. Mm-hmm. Uh, folks, that's another mm-hmm. book that's just tremendous. Um, how? What's the time frame here we're looking at? Because we, we've got. I mean, we see things happening if, with with expedience right now, especially in the Middle East with ISIS and what have you. Are we looking at things fulfilling? Prophecy being fulfilled here in in, in short order. What, 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 what do you think? Well, I believe that that the stage is being set for the seventieth week of Daniel, which is absolutely yet future. So um, there has to be a coalition of nations, as described by the prophet Daniel and Ezekiel and Isaiah and Revelation, to take place. So that when that coalition is in place, then the seventieth week will just go into operation.
because the 70th week of Daniel begins when the final Pope of Rome makes a seven-year agreement uh, protecting Jerusalem. And he makes an agreement with many nations. And there's also a UN, I think it's Resolution 181, that the UN has a special treaty with Jerusalem. So um, that is, that's, what's, that's what's being aligned. But I just see right now that the Jesuits, if they have their way, they're going to destroy the Reformation. The last vestige of the Protestant Reformation is going to be destroyed within the next 20 to 30 years. I maintain we're in, this, in another 30 years war. A 30 years war began in 2001, probably ended in 2030, something like that. And when that happens, uh, they will have everything in alignment, I maintain, for the unification of Europe, the unification of the Far East, unification of Africa, uh, the, the second Sunni caliphate that will be revived, Babylon's kingdom of Babylon, of Isaiah, uh, of Jeremiah 15, Jeremiah 51, and Revelation 18, that's a literal Babylon. Revelation 17 is the Roman Catholic Church. Revelation 18 is a literal Babylon. And uh, they'll have that in place, unified Europe. And so I maintain that they're, they're going to accomplish this through this next huge world war that they are beginning to put in motion. Interesting. Uh, I, I commonly refer to this time period in our program of kind of the lightning round because we, uh, throughout the uh, broadcast, we've been getting questions for you by email. And uh, one emailer, uh, I'm just going to uh, seemingly these these may be uh, unrelated questions. So uh, if you don't mind just rolling with it, it would be great. Uh, sure. Ralph listening live outside of Rome, Italy. Hi, Ralph. Uh, I believe that's. Great. It's a, kind of an odd spelling your name, but um, as uh, I just lost your email, I apologize. Um, uh, okay, let me hang on a second there. Let me get it back. Hold on, hold on. This is radio, live radio. I'm a pro. I can get this back. Uh, Ralph, um, Joe, you. I'm sorry. Can you bail me out here while I'm looking for Ralph's email? Hey, sorry, was, sorry, well, Eric. Just, I, 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 uh, sorry, okay. Eric. I, I, we're not professional oh, well, here, but go well, ahead if you. Uh, no, you're doing fine. Um, I do. Have so a you have for Ralph's you. calling from Rome. Uh -huh. uh, well? he, yeah, he sent an email here, and I, I accidentally closed it, and I got a page of emails, and there was a great email. Um, uh, okay, uh, Joe, help me out. While I'm looking forward here. I did not get the well, email. Well, make sure when he's in Rome, make make sure he goes to see Borgo Santo Spirito number five. Make sure he goes to see Yesu, and make sure he sees the headquarters for International Scottish Rite Freemasonry. Just have him go check him out. Okay, very yeah, good. We do have listeners in Rome. Karen in Rome. Hello, yeah. if you are listening. Um, one question here. Oh, I, I got it. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. Thanks for your patience, uh, Eric. Uh, oh sure. Mr. Sure. Schultz. So, um, the Eric's fine, question, please, Eric. Uh, okay. The, the question is this: uh, Rumor has it that all American, all U.S. presidents are related to British royalty. Is this true? And if so, how does this fit in with the Jesuit uh, uh, Jesuit uh, objectives? Well, according to Emmanuel Josephson, in one of his books, is his book is titled, I believe, uh, "The Federal Reserve and the Rockefellers." And Emmanuel Josephson says that when he wrote his book in 1968, he said that approximately one third of all the presidents were related, and indeed many of them to British royalty. However, that doesn't mean they're bad. Just because you're royalty doesn't mean you're bad. You can be a true Protestant and still be a royalty. And uh, so we just have to remember that. Just because they're of royal blood doesn't mean they're bad. Understood. Okay. Another question is from Emily. Uh, uh, from Iowa wants to know your take on the Antichrist. Will the Antichrist be, for example, uh, now I've got my own thoughts on this, uh, and I'll just defer to you in this in this uh, in this area. But uh, where will the Antichrist be, or, or who is the Antichrist if the Antichrist is walking around? What lineage that is? And it's quite a lengthy question, but uh, that's the gist of it. Okay. I maintain that in Revelation 17.10, we read about the seven heads and ten horns. In Revelation 17.10, uh, we read, and there are seven kings. It's basilized. They're kings. They're not kingdoms. They're kings. Five are fallen. They're died. One is. One was alive at this time, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. So there were seven kings of this Roman beast, 
So there were seven, there were seven Caesars, Roman Caesars. Five of them had died. I did a study on this many years ago and concluded that the first five were Caligula, Claudius, Nero, Vespasian, and Titus. They all persecuted the Jews, and they all attributed deity to themselves. Because remember, they have the name of blasphemy written on their foreheads. And blasphemy has to do with attributing deity to themselves. So, the one is Domitian. And this was a test. Persecuting the Jews, attributing deity to themselves. I had to check out Domitian. Sure enough, Domitian in 95, 96 AD, he was the reigning Caesar at the time. He fiercely persecuted the Jews and attributed deity to himself. So there were the six Roman Caesars did all these things. Well, there's one yet to come. Well, there are no Caesars. Unless the Pope is a Caesar. And that's what he is. Every Roman Pope is a Caesar. And I quote it in my book when the Pope says, I am Emperor, I am Caesar. So every Pope is a Caesar. I call them the Papal Roman Caesars. And there's coming a final Pope of Rome, a final Papal Caesar that will come, rise for a while, and then he's going to die, says right here, in verse, uh, and when he cometh, he continueth a short space. He's going to die. And then in verse uh, 11, and the beast that was and is not. That means he was living, he died, even he is the eighth and is of the seventh. So I maintain the seventh king is the beast. The seventh king is going to die, he's going to come back to life, he's going to be the eighth king, yet he's one of the seven. And this can only be, in my estimation, the final Pope of Rome because he's a Caesar. Like the previous six kings were all Caesars. And if you look in Daniel chapter 9, in Daniel 9, it talks about um, uh, that the, the princes shall come. He will destroy the city and the sanctuary. But look at this, in verse 27. And he, this princess shall come, in verse 26, in verse 27. And he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. This is the seventh Caesar of Revelation 17.10, the seventh Roman Caesar. He confirms a seven-year covenant treaty for many with many nations for one week. I mean, it has to be nations. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. He's slain, and he comes back to life. Beast that was and is not and yet is, in Revelation 13, he's slain. He comes back to life, and he causes the sacrifice and oblation to cease. What's that? To have a sacrifice and oblation, you have to have a third Hebrew temple. And then what does he, what does he do? He causes the overspreading of abominations. He shall make it desolate. He's going to make the temple desolate. That's why it's called the desolator. And even uh, until the consummation, the end, and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate, upon the desolator, the Antichrist. So the final Pope of Rome, whoever he is, is the final Roman papal Caesar. He engages, he sets up a seven-year agreement for the protection of Jerusalem because the prophecy of the 70 weeks concerns thy people and thy, thy holy city, the Jews, Hebrew Jewish Israelites, and Jerusalem. And so there will be a covenant with, for, for seven years for the protection of Jerusalem. And in the middle of that covenant, he breaks it. And he causes a sacrifice and oblation to cease. And then Second Thessalonians chapter 2, he goes down in the temple, showing himself that he is God. And then, according to Revelation 13, the false prophet who's a Jew, he erects an image of the beast, and he puts it in the temple. And the beast then, I maintain, will go to Babylon, and he'll be known as the king of Babylon. And he's going to take the whole Sunni caliphate. All of that will be his. All of Europe will be his. All of North Africa will be his. It's going to be a huge, massive empire under the final Pope of Rome, who's slain, risen from the dead, to be the Antichrist, king of Babylon. He'll probably change his name to something like Set or who knows what. But that's the end of human history. History with the final Superman Antichrist, and I maintain he'll be a white man, not the not like the black Nimrod. He'll be a white man. He'll be Roman, and this devil will rule the world for forty-two months. Uh, now, this question is from Doug Hagman, me, of course. Uh, would you entertain the thought? Uh, now, based on my research, I'm asking this question. Uh, uh, I'll just toss this out there. Would you entertain the thought that? Uh, um, the Antichrist. Uh, now, I understand your argument for the Antichrist, but could it, could it be very possible? Would you entertain the possibility that the uh, that we're looking at the possibility of the Antichrist arising from British royalty, given Never. the lineage? Never. Nope. Nope. Okay. I believe that uh, uh, Antichrist and a cup of tea, written by what was his name? Uh, T. 
Tim. I've got something? that book right here. Right. You got that book? Yeah, the, the Antichrist. No, I think right he's here. dead wrong in it. No, okay. the Antichrist. He's got to be a Roman. He's got to be a Roman. He's got to be a pope. Hmm. He's got to be okay. a Caesar. He's got to be a Caesar. British a royalty, Caesar. no doubt. He'll, British royalty, no doubt, will be involved. Pardon? Okay, well, isn't Caesar a title? Uh, as opposed to a, a name, I mean, he's got to be a Caesar. You're referencing a title now, correct? Okay, well, he well he's got to be a Roman king. Of Revelation okay. seventeen ten, it's got to be All a right. Roman king, and the kings of Rome were had the title of Caesar. Okay, the, the pope, right. The pope, okay, and the pope always considers himself a Roman Caesar. In fact, there's a throne in the Vatican, and it's called the throne for the king of Rome. Okay, all right, and and on that throne, uh, and I just had read something about this. Are there specific markings? In fact, I think I read it in your book. Were there sp specific markings on that throne that uh, indicate as much? The, I think so. so well, on, the, on, right. the, on, on the doors of the Vatican, you have you have um, images that one is one is um, uh, three bees with six wings. So that's six, and then another is the um, oh, I believe there's. Uh, six stars and one, but you have six, six, six. I have it in my book uh, on the Vatican. So you have right. six, six, six all across the Roman papacy. I mean, that's his number. I, so I it's got to be the Pope. It's got to be some final part. The, the Vicar of Christ, the title Vicar of Christ, and in, in, I think it was Latin, equals six, six, six in number also. Uh, that's I'm not true. sure if that's, that's exactly. okay. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's correct. That's right. Uh, sure right. does. Uh, and by, so the way, may. by the way, the, Je the, the Jesuit symbol, when you have the you have the all the different the crooked and the straight sunbeams there, you know, that's male and female. You have thirty two, thirty two spikes on the outside. You have three spikes pointing down that makes thirty five, and then you have one spike on the H, that's thirty six. If you add one plus two, that's three, and then three, and add that to three, that's six, and then four, add that, that's ten. You go all the way up to thirty six. You have six 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 hundred and sixty six. Interesting, interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, um, Sally May, uh, listening live from Spokane. God bless you, Sally. Uh, wants to know about the structure, the purpose of the structure of the obelisk and the Capitol dome, both in Rome and in Washington D.C., as it relates to the. Jesuit uh, sonic planning of, of uh, really both both cities. Mm -hmm. Well, the obelisks in any city in any city that you see them, you know that that city is run by Rome. Remember, it's wrong to call the obelisk in Washington the Washington Monument. George Washington would never have wanted such a thing, such an abomination. And I show in my PowerPoint from a book that I uh, have. Um, in fact, it was written by a Catholic about uh, for the capital city that Washington dismissed Leinfant, who was a French Freemason, for Le for Leinfant designing Washington after Rome. George Washington dismissed him for that. So the city was never. That's correct. It's a huge find. I just managed to stumble over it. I put it in my PowerPoint, my 2008 PowerPoint. So he never intended the, citizen, the, the city to be divine, designed after Rome. Washington was a friend of the ex-Jesuits of Georgetown, but he figured they were suppressed. But um, no, he was not involved. The Jesuits were not involved in the creation. The Jesuits wanted to see America destroyed. They wanted to see the whole revolution crushed and all the Protestants put back under the Anglican Church so the Jesuits control the Anglican through the Archbishop of Canterbury. And my top researcher is Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Arthur Bowser. He's 85 years old. I have him on my radio station. All he does is vindicate the American Revolution, showing that it was indeed of God, that Rome had no part in this. And there was the, there was the, the plot to overthrow George Washington, to get rid of him for Granny Gates. Uh, no, Washington was not involved in any papal plot to set this country up like that. Jefferson was, but not Washington. That's why Jefferson it, killed George Washington. Jefferson was involved in his assassination using Tobias Luther V. Cover that in my PowerPoint. 
But back to the lady's question, you have all these obelisks. I have in my PowerPoint, I see there's an obelisk in Istanbul, there's an obelisk in Paris, obelisk in London, obelisk in Washington, <laughs> pardon me, wherever you have these obelisks, it shows the Jesuit power through Freemasonry. And of course, it represents the male organ. <clears throat> Correct, and, and that's yeah, yeah. Go ahead. And, and in fact, the obelisk in Rome was taken out of Egypt. It's directly from the pharaohs in Egypt. So, the Pope yeah. is a pharaoh. Yeah. Yeah, the symbology from Egypt, uh, ancient Egypt, to Rome, to uh, America, and now throughout the world, is very in your face for anybody who uh, takes the time to research it. Uh, that's one of the first things in researching the Illuminati that uh, we get in. I got into is the symbolism, and the symbols mm -hmm. are for you know people who don't understand, uh, and for right. people who do understand. And uh, mm -hmm. the the obelisk, the uh, phallic symbol of uh, that are erected in Egypt, those are uh, not by accident that we have those in the three major uh, city states or the three city states that run the world today. That's right. That's exactly right. Rome is a religious capital. London is the economic capital, and Washington is the political military capital. Washington is the military capital of the world. Correct, and that's in your that's in your book. Uh, by by the way, uh, folks, once again, VaticanAssassins.org. Vatican Assassins is the name of the book. Great encyclopedic uh, download. What a great reference uh, book. Um, uh, to me, I just I, I, I'm still going through it. It's voluminous. Um, Jim K. Well, tell, 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 tell them the best part, Doug. The best part is it has 760 pictures and portraits because I can't read a book without pictures. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's true. It, 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 it is a very lively, what I would term a lively read. It's, or it's a lively book. And the, the, the portraits, I, I don't know how you assembled all of these, um, to be honest with you, uh, going through this. It's 400 megabytes. Many, of, of, yeah. It's neat. I mean, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Many, many long nights. Many answered I, prayers, and then I had a, a pastor friend, Nelson Turner, help me with it. He, he checked on lots of books. We found quotes together, so it was a it was a huge work, especially my 2007 edition, because it was I almost tripled the 2001 edition. 2001 edition was about a little almost 700 pages, 695. This is 1836. So I, I because somebody crashed my computer and just about wrecked my book and made me mad. I said, well, I'm just going to, if they want to do that, I'm going to write a, I'm going to triple the size. So. Oh, wow. And, and, and folks, by the way, you do have a um, uh, uh, section in there about uh, Malcolm X and, and the, uh, mm -hmm. him being unwittingly controlled by the order and so on. It, very interesting. And, and about the, you address the, the yeah. various religions yep. as well. Yep, yep. Yep, Francis Cardinal Spellman assassinated Malcolm X. Absolutely right. Audubon Ballroom. He was the high command of the FBI and the Nation of Islam that he controlled. And his wife, Malcolm X's wife, Betty, said so. Much for which reason she's going to be burned in a fire for saying that. So, uh, yeah, and then I touch on these other religions. I show that they're all controlled by the Pope, Orthodox Judaism, Islam. It's all controlled by the Pope, all of it. Okay. Well, one, one final question. I can't let you go without... Uh, Joe looked at me, and I looked at him when you said that uh, uh, Jefferson killed Washington. Uh, mm -hmm. Come again? <laughs> come yes. again? Okay. Wait. Yes. What? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I uh, I show that in my PowerPoint that I have with my seven transitions of American citizenship. Your listeners might want to get that. And I show that uh, <clears throat> that George Washington was an enemy of Jefferson, and he did not want Jefferson to become president. And he wrote extensively on it, had many letters on it. Well, it just so happened George Washington went out one one evening to attend his farm, and he had his his uh, big coat on when it was snowing because it was snowing at the time, and he came back with somewhat of a cough. Remember, this is the George Washington that went through Valley Forge. Uh, he was tough. He was yeah, strong. We, we toured Valley Forge yeah. and learned about all the uh, mm -hmm. impossibilities he overcame. Uh, 
It was huge. As, huge. A man yeah. of prayer on his knees begging God to deliver his army. And then God delivered his army when he brought the French in on his side and, and, and uh, Lafayette. And Lafayette loved Washington, considered Washington to be his father. Lafayette named his firstborn son, George Washington Lafayette. But anyway, um, Washington goes out and he catches a cold. He catches something in his throat. And he comes back, and Tobias Lear V gives him a gives him a handkerchief, something along those lines. In that, whatever he gave him, he gave him anthrax, because that was the Jesuits' favorite poisoning for the Indians. They give the Indians blankets laced with anthrax. And uh, so, as a result, Washington gets sicker. He has a terrible sore throat, and so then he has a problem breathing. Well, what happens? They call uh, they call one of the doctors. Uh, Dr. Krayak to bleed him. Dr. Krayak, who was another Mason working for the for for a, 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 a subversive Mason, because there were good Masons at the time. There were Masons that were truly patriotic, and uh, like Putnam and others. But here's this here's this conspiring Freemason who's Dr. Krayak, and he bleeds George Washington three times. He takes out somewhat 61 ounces of blood out of George Washington. Well, Washington's wife. Um, Martha begs him to stop bloodletting him. But this was the end for George because you need you need blood and iron to get oxygen to your tissues when you get this kind of poisoning. So he facilitated the death of Washington. Craig. And by the way, there was no Roman Catholic priest on the deathbed of George Washington. That's all F. Tupper saucy lies. Okay, that didn't happen. There's nothing the Jesuits started to tell that lie back in the nineteen fifties. There was no Jesuit priest or from Georgetown at his deathbed. The other thing was um, uh, Washington, after he was killed then, because he becomes our first murdered president, Tobias Lear V, who gave him the initial poisoning, he's brought into Je he The next thing he does is he burns all of George Washington's letters. Burns them. He should have been hung for it. He burns all of George Washington's private letters that would have, would have exposed Jefferson for the Illuminatus that he was, the Jacobin that he was at the time. And so with that, Jefferson, when he's elected president after Adams, he makes Tobias Lear V a very important man in his administration. No, wow. who benefits here? Jefferson benefits by the death of Washington and the burning of his private letters. The man right. who benefits takes the man responsible and puts him in his administration. George Washington was murdered. And the murderer was Thomas Jefferson, acting on behalf of, I'm sure, Jesuits and Jacobins that he was in collusion with at the time. But later, Jefferson repents. And when the Jesuits are revived, and uh, Jefferson exchanges letters with John Adams in 1819, and they lament the reorganization of the Jesuits. Well, Jefferson will be on the side of Monroe, writing up the Monroe Doctrine. So Jefferson obviously had a change of mind later on, for which he is poisoned on July 1st, 1826, with Adams, same day. Jefferson dies of dysentery. Addison dies at his desk right in the House of Representatives. Falls down dead. Both were poisoned. Very interesting. Wow. Yeah. So, Brother Eric, one last question, if we can, in the closing moments of the show. This from Katie. Uh, I think it's an interesting question. She'd like to know if you would comment on the demonic humanoids or those who live in the Vatican with elongated skulls. Are they real, and are they the real power behind all of this? I don't. I don't think so. I know that these these people with these kind of skulls they do exist. Um, but I don't think they're the real power. I think the real power is Satan with his high principalities, powers, dominions, and rulers of Ephesians 6. And they run the Jesuits. No doubt the Jesuits, the high ones, are all possessed by devils. And um, But I, I, I'm not sure. Of the, I, I know that skulls exist from, from the past, from archaeological digs. But um, I maintain that the Jesuit Malachi Martin was right, that the Vatican's run by Satan. If you read his book, Windswept House, it's absolutely run by the devil, and that's his throne right now, and he rules the world through the Pope of Rome, and the Pope of Rome is policed and controlled by the Jesuit order. The Jesuit order is the Praetorian Guard, what the Praetorian Guard was to the Roman Caesar. They're called the Obsidian Order, and they make sure the Pope stays on track 
doesn't suppress the Jesuits, doesn't get liberal, and they keep him in order. And if he gets out of hand, they get rid of him. Interesting. No, no, uh, Mr. Phillips, do you still you still broadcast three day uh, three times a week, correct? On, on or, yes, or no? I, okay. Yes, I'm on twenty four seven World Radio from ten to twelve, uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and I'm on Liberty Radio Live uh, every Monday from five to six, and from and Wednesday five to six. Uh, generally, sometimes I'm on Friday, but definitely Monday and Wednesday. And then on my twenty four seven World Radio, I have. Uh, I have other men that uh, do speaking and preaching, and I have it in six different languages, preaching the gospel and also exposing the Jesuits in Hindi, in French, in Russian, in Dutch, in German, and uh, wow. the Polish. Polish, yes. So six different languages, exposing the Jesuits, preaching the gospel. So uh, trusting the Lord, he will help us financially to provide because no one's ever done this before. So that the people no. of the nations and their languages can hear what the Jesuits have done to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What a wonderful, what a wonderful endeavor! What a wonderful uh, enterprise you have! Um, and, and I want to say once again how uh, re really blown away I am reading and going over the five volumes that comprise your book, Vatican Assassins, folks. Um, as I said, I'm still going through it, having gotten it last week. Uh, it's really a remarkable work, a piece of research, and I just want to thank you, Mr. Phelps, for not only writing it, but dedicating yourself to the truth and also being so generous with your time uh, spending it with us tonight. Well, I'm so glad you invited me because I don't get these opportunities very often. So I want to thank you for having me on and thank you for listeners for uh, for enduring me for three hours. <laughs> oh, it was it was our pleasure, and uh, I'm telling you, but by the responses we're getting right now, and, and they're coming in uh, to coin a uh, uh, phrase, "fast and furious," they're coming in very quickly, uh, overwhelmingly positive, and uh, just thanking you, wanting us to express our thanks for you for coming on, my friend. God bless you. Please stay safe out there. Obviously, you're you're exposing some pretty. Pretty dangerous stuff. Um, uh, hopefully, you are taking your security precautions pretty seriously. Yes, I, I do my best to stay right with God. Try to keep sin out of my life. Try to do His will every day and seek His face every morning. And just appreciate the prayers of your listeners and yourself. Uh, that the Lord would bless, protect me, and enable me to keep doing this as long as as long as He'd like me to. So, oh, it's been a Thank pleasure. It's been an on. honor, sir. God bless you. Thank okay. you so much, sir. Lord, Lord bless. Bye-bye. Right. Lord bye -bye. bless you too, brother. Fantastic show. Um, that was, so much information. Yeah. And as we always say, you know, not, I mean, this guy put decades of work into his research. He has cited his his uh, uh, sources and, and information where he's found it. Tons of footnotes in his book. Um, whether you believe it or not, that's something you need to take to the Lord in prayer. Sure. Do the research for yourself, as with every guest, you know. We, we, you know, Joe, it's it's one thing, too. I just want to say this. and um, When we do research, oftentimes Joe and I will do, do research on a similar topic or the same topic and come to different conclusions. So just keep that in mind as you're listening to the nice broadcast or re-listening to it. Um, it's easy to, you know, the, the, look, the evidence is the evidence. That's kind of our motto. If if you have documentation, if you've got evidence, it should speak for itself. Now, sometimes the conclusions that we all draw from that evidence, may, we may not agree with one another. Um, it's not to say, you know, it's just a matter of fact, isn't it? So, Yeah. Uh, just a quick correction. I know it says tomorrow Nathan Liao will be joining us, but he will not be with us. He had a kind of a, a crisis at home. He had no running water for almost a week, oh. and he finally got his water back on. And he said he is uh, he he was trucking water for his animals and his house back and forth uh, for half his day while his water was out. And now that he's finally got it back, he said he's exhausted, and he asked if uh, he wouldn't mind if we could reschedule. And uh, we said, you know, absolutely. Uh, but just uh, thanks for everybody who was praying for him, uh, and he is okay, and we will have him on soon, but he will not be on tomorrow. So uh, we will be here, though, 8 p.m. Until then, I want to say thank you for, for joining us, uh, and have a great night, everyone. God bless. Stay safe.